Hello and welcome to Is This England, a show where we talk about old England games and ask just how England was this. Today we're dipping into Euro 2000 where Kevin Keegan, our man for the new millennium, leads England into battle against Luis Figo and his Portuguese pals. Welcome to the show. It's Kevin Keegan time, Nick. <laughs> Always you, a fun time, isn't it? I say, are you excited? Yeah, I really am. Just having watched him in a game and just see all the emotions he goes through, like no matter what, like he could be opening like the post and it could be the <laughs> best and worst day for him ever within, yep. within the same letter almost. And we've heard him on commentary against uh, England versus Italy in the Bicentennial Cup as well. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. He's, he popped up there, didn't he? Very quiet at times, like he wasn't allowed to speak, which I think was the more the style back then, but it was just like he's always there lurking. Yeah. And, like, something awful happening to him in the background. I don't think we've revisited um, the Keegan era since the, the Scotland 1-2. No, I think we were just cursed off that with our recording, yeah. <laughs> weren't we? Well, hopefully today goes a bit better. Before we jump into the show, if everyone can give us a five-star review on podcast platforms such as apple podcast spotify i don't think acast actually does them anymore but wherever you can if you see an option to put stars five will do <laughs> always five get them in there we can we can always use that so new people come and find us and hear us before rob becky gets in exactly it's <laughs> leverage it's insurance and it's a down payment and it's of, a copyright as well it's copyright <laughs> exactly um if you wanted to get in touch with the show as well, email isvisenglandpod at gmail.com and you can find us on social media at isvis underscore England. Brilliant. Time capsule. We're in the year 2000, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Euro 2000. Uh, Nick, do you want to give us your cultural bombshell for <laughs> the year 2000? Yeah, 2000. Um, I think recently I've watched, as of you, we discussed the other day, we watched the Netflix documentary for Woodstock 99, didn't we? Yes. Something that has appeared in the time capsule before, but never actually made it into the time capsule. No, that wasn't that in the time capsule. It was for 1999, oh, it which was, was obviously the year that that happened. But I think it was when we were still doing and it, another thing in was, the news. It was like an extra note. <laughs> yeah, just and something that, that happened. The last time we saw Kevin in, in the hot seat. It was, yeah. Well, culture's not really got better since then, If I'm uh, in terms no. of like, it was just an awful period when I look back. Like, I think we probably struggled to put stuff in. I know it probably have been like, I think The Sopranos is what you put in and, and I put in a Dre album, which are you know, really great yeah. things but when i was watching that woodstock documentary i was just like god everything is terrible isn't yeah. it like i looked at the films and they're not like great either like there's nothing really happening there tv's all right at points and really high things but the music's not incredible either and you just like that woodstock thing just summed it all up just these like louts and mm. lad culture like getting more aggressive than it needs to be oh. as well i think it's it's almost like uh with the millennium coming up, mm. it was like a bank holiday and, yeah. and civilization <laughs> just, just phoned in the last couple of days. It, the... was, it was like the Saturday of a bank holiday where people were like, well, I've got two days to recover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. for the August it's one. boiling. I don't need a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, that documentary was horrible, man. So you've watched it now, have you? Uh, yes, I've watched it up to, a, up to a point, but I've got, already got the point where it's all going sideways and it's just like, I've paid my money to be here. I'll do whatever the hell I want. And... You kind of see that as we as we look on to what England is and the England fans and all that other stuff, which we'll get to as well. But Very I true. thought, well, well, what am I doing at this point in my life? What do I enjoy? I enjoy wrestling at this point. <laughs> I'm not into football yet, so that's still got to come. Um, so I was like, well, what was I doing? I was playing the PlayStation 2. Yes, now that is a high point. Yeah. That's signing off the Millennium. On, yeah. a good, you know, on a good note. We're in there. It's the year 2000, the release of the PlayStation 2 in March. I think it was released in Japan first, and it went on to become the biggest selling gaming console in history, shifting 155 million units. <laughs> that is an insane amount. Gotta love the PS2. Yeah. It felt like such a uh, huge step forward. Was there a game, a first game that you kind of like, oh... Because I remember seeing stills for the wrestling game. 
Yeah. Smackdown, I think it was. Would Smackdown been, 3. Would have been one of those. Yeah, yeah, I loved that. And I, I was like in like the PlayStation magazines <laughs> and I was like, this looks so much better. Like levels and levels and level, levels above. I have to have a PS2. Yeah. Didn't get it for a while. I don't think I ever got that game. I got some of the later ones, but um, was the one that that caught your eye? I think I loved I loved all the wrestling games. I would just because I don't have any like siblings or anything, so in an evening that was just my life of just well, I'm making my own federation and yeah. I'm going to do this with all these and all the create your own people and bring all those in. So I remember doing that, and then I looked at like actually what were some of the other ones that like stand out to people. I mean, the hours I must have spent playing uh, Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, Grand Theft Auto. Just people lost a lot, like days and lives in that, didn't they? Really? I think that's what got me a PS2. I think yeah. um, we went to my cousin's house and he had Vice City, and my dad was like, "Man, gone. <laughs> this is seriously good." <laughs> Next thing I know, Jord, you've got a PS2, and I'm going to use it, and I'm going to use it. <laughs> he did used to love Vice City. I think, uh, I think. I think my dad used to always love the Gran Turismo games. Like, yeah, I think we I had that I, as well. I think I had one. I'm, you were looking at it, you were like, "Wow, look how." shiny the cars were it wasn't even that they looked amazing they were just so shiny <laughs> did you do that thing that everybody does on any game and go to like the nearest water source water source every time every, oh yeah i see what you mean to yeah, test yeah. the graphics people always go look at the water <laughs> look at that reflection in the water wow you can see my cube headed bloke can't you in there <laughs> yeah and another great thing with it though is that you could also play ps1 games on it so it was backwards compatible yeah so even if you were still loving your old game you still had the memory cards i think to do it as well you could probably transfer those over yeah and it was just it was just amazing i mean i mean i've written down some of like the games that well, I, I researched and was like you know all these came out and not saying I played all these because I probably just had one wrestling game and that was all I ever played with Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> but you've got three different Grand Theft Autos in three, four, and five. Granddad. In what? In terms of Grand Grand Theft Auto three, four, and five. <laughs> it's Grand Theft Auto three, Grand Theft Auto Vice City, and Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Oh, you're using names now, are you? <laughs> Nobody oh. calls them three, four, and five. Yes, they do. Do they? Yeah. I'm, I mean, no, you can use your Vice City and all that stuff, but... I'm Okay. I may was not... it the fourth one? Probably not. Right, but... right. I think it goes Grand Theft Auto 3, mm. Grand Theft Auto Vice City, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, right. Grand Theft Auto 4, Grand Theft oh, Auto there's... 5. So there's like a story element to like, like, la like lateral or something. One goes back to the 80s or something, does it? That's Vice City. I think you've mentioned it before, actually. But... I don't think there's a, a no. I don't. I don't think there's a story element that like links links those. Okay. Grand Theft Auto Four, I think, would have been the PS3, mm. and was like the uh, I think it was Russian mafia. Oh, maybe. Guy. And Five is the last one that came out, which is about ten years ago now. There's no way of knowing. There's no way of knowing. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm saying it's the those are the ones that came out on there in terms of you know the numbered game at least in terms of the order it came out. Grand Theft Auto 3. So there were three on Grand there. Grand Theft Auto 80s yes. and Grand Theft Auto Hip Hop. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto, the Russians are here. <laughs> no, no, that was later. <laughs> Come on. Anyway, you got any problem with Resident Evil games? Um, the scary. Yeah, I didn't like them either. <laughs> I, got, I think I got two and played it around my mate's house and was just like, I only feel safe playing it here. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I, I think I played the, the original one at my house when I was really young. And I walked around a mansion and like one dining room for about an hour. Yeah. And then something happened and a zombie came out and I pretty much just took the disc out and hid it somewhere because I was like, well, it, can't, it can't hurt me over there. Dogs jumping through windows. Yeah, lots of those. That was terrifying. Um, I, well, I, th I think four came out on this, but I don't There must be other ones that came out. I, it can't all have been PlayStation 1 that did that. We're getting slightly sidetracked, but still. Yeah, we're really getting <laughs> this to is, This isn't Is This Games. <laughs> we are no equipped to do that. No, definitely. But yeah, stuff like Prince of Persia games. Tony Hawk's people love those games as yeah, well. I mean, yeah. again, another one that I used to just play when I was around someone's house. It wasn't like something I went to. But again, Gran Turismo is there. Varying numbers of Final Fantasy games. Again, no idea what order they all come in. Uh, and again, numerous. Metal Gear Solid, but... This was the... That the, was it. The golden era of Pez. Would it have been for the two or the three? I thought it may have been the three where it was like, I really got into it and then it was like, okay, the wrestling game goes in the bin. This is what mm. I'm playing forever now. I reckon it was the two. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. Pro Evolution Soccer 5 was on the PS2 with John Terry and um, Thierry Henry on the front. There you go. Yeah, definitely would have been when I was getting very good at these games. PlayStation, the, the amount of errors sunk into the PlayStation 2. Yeah. Oh. You may have even been able to get, there was a, a, there's one on here that says it's for the PlayStation, the PES 6 as well. Maybe that was like backwards as well, because mm. you, they still bought them out on the old versions. 
So maybe you had to have them on there too. But yeah, the PlayStation 2, the best thing in the year 2000. One of the best things ever. Yeah, I mean, if we were doing a ranking of the time capsule, yeah. that's high up, isn't that's it? Up. That's England winning the World Cup if we ever put that in. We and probably have, but... You'd never put, like, the PS5 or, like, a, a modern era console in because... No. I don't know. Maybe some squares have put the Xbox. Yeah, or some young people. <laughs> Disgusting. Yeah. Well, they'll never be on the pod, so... No, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We reject any uh, young people who want to appear on this show. <laughs> Um, my time capsule for the year 2000 is Series 2 of The League of Gentlemen. Uh, I struggled, like you said, with finding TV, music, mm. films. Culturally like, relevant things. Yeah. <laughs> that weren't awful. Um, I guess by Series 2 of the show. Uh, well, first of all, actually, just a, bit, a brief bit of love for the show from me. I think it's one of the one of the best, uh, you know, one of the most original sitcoms I've ever seen. It's so broad to even think of it as a sitcom as well, yeah, isn't it? It's just yeah. like, I feel dirty even thinking about that because it's just so freaky. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly a long way from Friends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, slightly. Series series one and two were great. Uh, that They were more of a, not a sketch show format, but there was, you know, you'd see one character and then you'd jump to another one and what have you. Whereas the third series was... Um, I hate to even explain that because it's quite forward thinking. Is that like a story or something that goes throughout it? Yeah, so the, each episode would focus solely on like one or two characters and then something would happen at the end and then the next episode would focus on two different characters. Something would happen at the end and you'd see how it would link with what happened in the first one. So the last yes, scene of like each of them that. all like combine. Is it like in a street or something? Yeah, like yeah. Like a car came down a street. Yeah, I've yeah. only ever watched ev- it all through like once <laughs> in like a spell like years and years ago and i was just like that was great and for some reason i just never picked it up again but i loved it when i watched it the uh series two anyway um of the league of gentlemen i I, I think this is really a good one because it wasn't a difficult second series it didn't uh, stutter after the success of Mm. the first and it's also the first time we're introduced to papa lazaro the show's most iconic character really i would say so yeah probably the most troublesome as well (laughs) don't don't get me started (laughs) Um, I'll just say I don't see him as troublesome. He's okay. he, he's not. Oh, I mean, he causes trouble. He causes <laughs> trouble, yes, but not trouble to get him taken off Netflix. I don't. Okay. I don't. Is know. it off Netflix? Is it? Yeah. Oh, um, okay. For, for reasons, it's all it's all out there. But I think yeah. fans of the show would probably say, and they're probably biased. Yeah. But fans of the show would probably say it's it's the wrong reason. You've missed the point. You've missed the point of that character. Yeah. Who is. I don't even know an old school carny yeah. sort of. He's just he's just a weird bloke. Yeah, <laughs> that's and the nicest thing you could say. A weird man. He doesn't exist in terms of uh, culture or or background or anything like that. He's just something that landed on this earth. And yeah, he was an entity all to himself. Yeah. Um. We, so yeah, it's the first season where we see him. Uh, the main climax of uh, series two centers around an epidemic spreading through Royston Vasey caused by the special stuff sold by the butcher Hilary Briss. Right, okay. Yeah. Special stuff is basically human meat. Right, okay. <laughs> Everyone starts getting nosebleeds in the town <laughs> and it's just it's just crazy. The show really, I, I actually watched it a little bit uh, when I was younger. I think when it was on originally with my dad. And it did make me laugh in bits, some of the sillier bits, but um, I did find it really scary. And yeah. it wasn't until I was about 26, 27 but that I revisited, revisited the show. Mm. Did you have any experience of it when you were younger? And- just it was like, I felt like it was just ever so slightly, I was too young for it, I felt, when it came out. So it was just like a few people like, oh, I love the legal, gen- legal gentleman. And I was like, is that a comic or what is that? I mean, you mean that creepy thing that's on TV <laughs> that everyone thinks is funny, but clearly isn't, even though I've never watched an episode of it. It yeah. was just like, this isn't my safe children's, like you say, friends, Frasier, those kind of things. I'm just like, I know what that is. It's Blackadder. And instead it's just this horrible dimension that I don't want to <laughs> enter into, basically. Um, yeah, as I say, I, I kind of feel the same. I remember re-watching it. Um, probably with my dad again a uh, couple of years after it had finished and being like, okay, I find it less scary now, but also the silly stuff doesn't mm. make me laugh anymore and there are no other jokes. Turns yeah. out there are. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to wait a few years, I think. <laughs> uh, returning as an adult, I-, I love everything about the show. I also think Inside Number 9 is a great vehicle for um, 
uh, Steve Pemberton and Reece Shearsmith. I nearly forgot which one was which. I've just got the, the, the second names in my notes. Um, yeah, it kind, of, it kind of allows them to spread their wings in all different directions. I think if you watch it back and you think League of Gentlemen is the first thing that they've written, mm. you think, God, they're definitely different and, the prop, and they can obviously try the hands at multiple different genres. And the three of them as well, who kind of are the stars in it too, are like they've all gone on to big things like either together or in films or, or separately as well. And like you say, for all three of them to be such stalwarts of British kind of comedy and film and, and culture, really, it's it's like, yeah, this was the breeding ground for it. Definitely. Um, give them all a knighthood, I say. <laughs> <laughs> They'll reject it. <laughs> <laughs> right then. Uh, why this game? Why are we looking at England versus Portugal from Euro 2000? Uh, I think I picked this one, didn't I? I think you did, yeah. It I was a George I, pick. It was a George pick, so it was going to be fun-filled, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why this game? Big, big memes. Mm. Um, I remember being, like, nine. I think, well, I don't remember being nine. Yeah. You, you don't think I'm nine, do you, when you're nine? Here I am, I'm nine. <laughs> <laughs> I remember sitting there and thinking, I'm nine, yeah. This is great. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> well, I thought it would be great because yeah. uh, I was... Turned on to football by France 98 and Michael Owen. And in my mind, we'd only had two years to get better. Mm. Since then, uh, we had a new manager who everyone seemed to like. Absolutely, yeah. So everything seemed positive. Um, I also remember watching this game um, and prior to it starting, thinking, Portugal, <laughs> what's next? <laughs> who are they? Who are we going to play next? Bloody, I don't even know, <laughs> Mozambique. <laughs> yeah, they're in the same place. That's yeah. Fine, yeah, I just thought they would be proper minnows. Mm. Never heard of them. They weren't Brazil, Italy, Argentina or Germany. So they're going to be no trouble for our boys. And you've just got less access as well, haven't you? Like, yeah. really, if you're of that age and then if they hadn't been in France 98 either, which we'll get on to, you're just like, okay, well, this is Portugal. That's where people go on holiday, isn't it? Yeah. Like, All right, Malta's next. It's just like, there you go. <laughs> England versus Tenerife. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, at the time as well, there would have been big, big, big uh, David Beckham and Michael Owen love. Um, yeah, yeah. Beckham getting his angel wings back after France 98 in, in the eyes of some. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And the start of the redemption story of Beckham really is the is what happens after 98. And we're kind of in that awkward middle ground with Beckham now as well in, at this game where he's clearly one of the best players in the world, but he's still going to get booed at all the grounds he goes to just because yeah. of what happened. And it's just like, it's pathetic. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk more on that. Mm. Uh, why we pick this in the context of the pod, so not just the memes. I think it's been a while since we look back at the Keegan's era, as we said. Um he wasn't in the job for particularly long. No. And um, so we've got to kind of ration out the Keegan <laughs> era. But, I mean, this has got to be era-defining. First game in a major tournament against really good opposition. A big test. A big test for Keegan as well, who kind of being claimed that, you know, after what happened in the Scotland um, qualifiers as well in the playoffs, where it was like England went and, and, and did what they did in terms of getting through, there were questions starting to be answered about him around this time as well. And yeah. you just start to think, all right, then clean slate. You know, the, the phrase, the always, the phrase I always think of him as well, which I heard Rob Smiley say was always, it'll be all right on the night under Keegan, which I just think is so yeah. perfect. Well, this is the night. And this is the start of that night, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. This is, this is the bit where we go, right, let's see if it all works. Yeah. And it's great opposition to start it off. Let's have a quick look at the state of football. No doubt we'll come back to Euro 2000 a few times. So uh, briefly, do, we, do you want to start us off and, and touch on the state of football? Yeah, yeah. As you say, we'll um, we'll keep it brief because we'll be back here in a couple of uh, well, a couple of times as well. Uh, Man United did win the Premier League for the sixth time in eight years. Uh, after seeing off Arsenal on all fronts uh, to win the treble the previous year, they were left with only league title in this season the carling league title the carling champions weren't they this one it was the carling <laughs> premiership I carling think. premiership yeah because it when was that period when it went from premiership to premier league no idea. and now whenever anybody says premiership i get like a little twitch of like it's premier league yeah like it, i just can't help it like i know there's a period where it changed and the branding does that i mean you can never imagine it not being barclays now can you no the the epl as well APL, APL yeah, where, yeah. at this point it would have just been the, the CP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just just the title for United then. Uh, 92 points, 18 clear of the nearest rivals, Arsenal. Uh, bettered only once by Man City in 2018. That points total is when obviously they accumulated 100 points and finished 19 points ahead of Man United. 
Yeah. Hair the worm has turned. I know, yeah. It's very uh, very scary at that point. But really, we look back at you know Manchester United in this season, finished 18 points clear of Arsenal, like we said. Today, when you look at that Man City side, you go, well, actually, they finished 19 points ahead of United. Aren't they one of the great teams ever? As soon as anybody has any form oh. of a massive gap or... Makes you sick. It makes me sick. But any kind of this success, we are straight away to go, they're one of the best teams. Yeah, that's And, what, it's, that's and what... it's just like... Just can we not have everything's the best thing that's ever happened <laughs> yeah. or the worst thing? Yeah, like you, you'll get to May mm. or, or sorry, April, and it'll be like City are clear at the top of the league. They're in the Champions League semi final. They've won the Carabao Cup mm. and they're in the FA Cup semi final. Mm. And all you hear is, is this the best team of all side? And they yeah. end up winning the Premiership. Yeah. And and that's it. And it's, it's like they've done it in some, some style. I mean, don't yeah. get me wrong, but. Why would you say, why would, and it's every year, it was Liverpool the year before. Well, the last year it was Liverpool as well, because it was, they'd won um, the League Cup, they were going towards the FA Cup final, oh, course, they were in yeah. the Champions League, going towards the semi-final at that point, and they were close to City in the league, and it was like, this is the greatest team we've ever <laughs> seen in the history of the Premier League, and it's like, you know, they've won a league title in this period, and they are a great Premier League side, but just... And it's not Liverpool fans in particular I'm talking about. It's just the media it's have the to media. now go, best thing ever, you've got to be into this. And you look at this Man United side at this point, they're 19, 18 points ahead of their nearest rivals. And I think that more says more about the league on occasions like this when there's just no other team that can really take points off them. I think they lost three times this season, Man United. One of them was a 5-0 loss at Chelsea. Bit of an aberration, really. Yeah. They lost when they were down to 10 men against Newcastle once as well. And there was another game also. And you just think, well, yeah, but I'd say the league isn't really ready for them at this point. Because, no. you know, the, the challenges around them. Arsenal collapsed after the double in 98. Uh, Leeds' team, who were coming up, seemed a bit too young, really, for, for them to really kick on and do something and needed investment. Liverpool just weren't a thing at this point in the, in the league either. So you're like, well... No. Or who are, who is going to beat them to take these points off them? And I think this is what feeds into that. Aren't Liverpool the best? This current Liverpool team, the best football team of all time. It, it is. You do look back and some great achievements, Ferguson's era. But mm. um, the league isn't what it was now. Mm. But what are they going to do? Play then against City now? It yeah. just it just can't happen. So it's so it's so difficult to see with and compare them as well. But even like you look in the Premier League now, well, everyone's got money. Mm. I mean, you look at, I think the lad, is it, who's uh, Leon, who's moving to Nottingham Forest, I and mean, Aurier, I think his name is, or however you pronounce that. He's at Leon. He's a really good player then. He's going to a team that's probably going to get relegated. Yeah, Wolves are signing a midfielder for Sporting Lisbon, 50 mil, and it's like a, uh, a Pep has called him one of the, the best players in the world over recent years as yeah. well, and it's seen as a big signing for them. I think it's good for at some level yeah <laughs> like i'd like to see that i'd like to see some of those teams like crystal palace or wolves or what have you like really push yeah but then at the same time bigger teams are spending more money anyway yeah. so the gap just continues and then these in inverted commas smaller clubs are left with huge like potential de like debt yeah or what have you hanging over i'm sure it's all managed sensibly in some way but just crazy. But you had like, even back in the day, you would have like teams like um, West Ham or, or Sheffield Wednesday or whoever. They had players who were really good players back in this era of like the 2000s. And it felt more competitive because anybody could beat anybody. Mm. I mean, this particular year, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's lots of other teams, but it's just one team really uh, pressing forward. And the only other team who comes away with something really good this season, you'd probably say is Chelsea. They won the FA Cup um, in the last uh, FA Cup final. To be played at the old Wembley, they win 2 0. Ah. And and they're not consistent either at this point either. They're still not challenging for league titles. And it'll be three years until Abramovich comes along where they do actually start putting it together. And what do they need? They need the investment to do that. Yep. As you say, two phases, the start of the decline. Yeah. <laughs> it really feels like we're at some sort of point with football at the moment. I, d I don't know where. Something's got to give sooner or later. Mm. It, it just, it literally cannot carry on. Well, look at Barcelona with what they're doing. That's probably what's making me think it, yeah. Yeah, just kind of like, okay, they can still register all these players and they buy them on who knows what and how. Yeah. They've, they've sold 25 year, 25% 25 of the next 25 years of TV income. Yeah. I mean, who knows what, what could happen? I mean, like, and they also sell like, bits of their media channel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, probably st st parts of stadiums and got yeah. all the drinks machines or God knows what else. Anyway, at one point, Nick, we did think that uh, things were going to be improving. 
yeah. in this new millennium. Yeah. <laughs> and what better way to start this new millennium than with a uh, big Euros, a big tournament. Let's have a look at how England sort of got there. Well, mm-hmm. last time we saw Keegan in charge in the big hot seat at Wembley. Uh, yeah, actually, it wasn't at Wembley, was it? It was, <laughs> it was at Hampton Park. Uh, well, it was the last time we saw him. So they'd been gone to Hampden and they'd unconvincingly won 2 0. Oh, and it was at Wembley the, the and, return. Yeah. And then the return game is one of. Oh, is it? It's not as bad as the Algeria game, <laughs> no. which will never be beaten. That's, ta- that's, a, that's a given. But I remember watching that second leg and Scotland win 1 0 at Wembley. And it is just dreadful, that yeah. game. And England just don't seem to know what they're doing. All the players are in the right position, seemingly, but they can't even kick the ball straight, it seems, or, or do anything really. And. That was the one I kind of went, wow, this is this is dangerous, it feels like, for England. Yeah, so that was the last time we saw Keegan at Wembley losing to Scotland. Yeah, being outsmarted, as they say, um, uh, by the Scotland manager. Uh, and as well, you know, look, 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 it's the year 2000. That's in the dark and dreary past of 1999. And Kevin Keegan has somehow survived the millennium bug. Yeah. And he is ready to test this England team against the toughest around just building up to the tournament as well. I can imagine Keegan with the millennium bug just <laughs> talking it up before. And I, I don't believe any of this. It's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. <laughs> it's just silly. <laughs> and then just like he's there with a little party hat on and a little flipping <laughs> sparkler at 2359. And he's sitting there going, told you it was enough. <laughs> 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 I'm fine. <laughs> and, and, and just really worrying. I've got to go to hospital, Gene. All, all the lights have gone off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bugger. Um, or, on the alternative, he'd be wrapped up nice and warm in bed by 10pm because he can't be doing with a fuss and palaver. Oh, he's so is such a, a go-to-bed before the midnight on, yeah. on New Year's Eve, isn't it? No, none of that rubbish. I've got to get to B&Q tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Beat the queues. Yeah, definitely. Get the sales in. Uh, in February 2000, to kick off the uh, new millennium, England played Argentina at Wembley, drawing nil-nil against Shock Horror, a really good Argentina side. Uh, this is Bielsa's Argentina with players like Varane, Batistuta and Ortega at the top of their game. But on the uh, the free Lions side, it's seen as Heskey's coming of age for England. Uh, Alan Shearer said he liked playing with Heskey as he, is enjo- as he enjoyed having a physical partner up front. Uh, time for Michael Owen to hit the gym. Yeah, just a bit, isn't it? Can we talk a little now about the Keegan Owen dynamic? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because in my mind, as I mentioned earlier, memories leading up to this tournament as a youngster, Beckham love, Owen love, off the charts, mm. and he must have been playing good for Liverpool. Yet Keegan and Owen didn't really get on, did they? No, they didn't. And it's it's a bit strange why it seems like he's the only person in that England squad that. Uh, that Keegan ever almost not actively tried to like put down, but there's times when he just wasn't convinced by him really. And you kind of think, well, why? Like, I think he had a bit of an injury uh, in 98, 99. I think that was his first injury where you're like, okay, that blistering pay- place that just obliterated yeah. sides that kind of went a little bit, but he's still the quickest player on the pitch in pretty much every game he's in. And he's young and you think mm. he would benefit from, Positive man, manage, man management, sorry, which like, is Keegan all over. Yeah, so it's just strange that he kind of he he's um he, didn't he tell him that he just wasn't convinced by him or something like that in front of the team, in front of the whole team, pretty much. And he just said something about him basically just being not being good enough. And the only reason you're playing is like because allegedly you're good enough and all that. And if it was up to me, only me, and not everyone around us, you wouldn't be playing. It's just like this is your big talent, really, isn't it? And <laughs> Professionally, they didn't get on at all. I think Michael Owen wrote in his book about just saying how much they just couldn't stand each other professionally and that. Personally, I think he, I think he quite liked him as a person, but it was just like this constant battering of him like all the time and like weird roles for him too. Yeah, so he wanted to play uh, Owen as, up front with Shearer as sort of the, uh, well, with Owen being like the hold up man. Yeah, him kind of like dropping like drop deep to hold the ball up and Shearer playing on like... On, on the, the back of the defender, it's like, well, Shearer is very old at this point and he's not got, like, and, any pace. And he's strong and he'd, yeah. be, he'd be good at that role. Yeah. Why, why you s- just flip it round? In that Scotland game we watched, I remember seeing it and going, this just feels weird, doesn't it? I don't think it actually happens in as much of today's game as I thought it would. But maybe, you, maybe we'll see it as we go around through the tournament where you're like, okay, maybe this is, this is that weird thing is coming up again. Do you think maybe 
somebody called Keegan Soft or something like that, and he's like, I'll show him, and just pointed it in all the wrong directions. Yeah, like you pick on the biggest bloke in prison on your first yeah, day, and he's but, just like, well, who's the most promising in here? You, I'll ruin yeah, you for England. <laughs> I'll show you Soft. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I thought it'd be worth touching on that. Um, obviously, uh, Michael Owen was still very much at the forefront of England's plans despite this. Um, yeah. I don't think Keegan could have really got away with dropping him. No. Um, after the Argentina game, England didn't play another game until May, uh, hosting Brazil this time in a 1-1 draw with the goal for England scored by Michael Owen. A lovely little solo goal. I watched the highlights of this and he just kind of, I think he kind of almost steps on the ball then just all of a sudden just takes it past a couple of players and puts it in the corner and it's, yeah, a lovely finish, and the uh, the headline from the Guardian read: "Defiant but dull England live on in hope." That is so Keegan, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, defiant but dull. Defiant but dull, living in hope. Yeah, absolutely. He wasn't known as dull before England, was he? But some, no, some he, of the some of the players he's got in his squad. Yeah, but he kind of he, he's in that awkward period where Graham Taylor was as well, wasn't he? When he's actually taken over England in a really good period but everyone's just a bit wrong. Like something's wrong with yeah. everyone almost. No one's in that sweet spot of really good in their peak. Everyone's either a bit too old or a bit too young or a bit too injured or a bit too out of form yeah. or something's kind of going wrong. And he never kind of has all the pieces in place like to help him on here. And, and yeah, I guess the squad depth wasn't that deep over, but we'll probably touch on that more as we go. Preparation continues anyway for Euro 2000 with England beating Ukraine 2-0 at home. Goals on this day coming from Robbie Fowler and Tony Adams. More experimentation. Yeah, yeah. He also plays a Steven Gerrard at right back on his England debut. Mm, what the fuck? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why did he do that? just trying some stuff out you know this, this is the time to do it against ukraine at home before a tournament just whack him in his wrong position i was gonna say jack and keegan's going to him look i wouldn't ask and i promise you it won't happen again <laughs> but you're gonna have to play out of position for england and look you have my word i know your parents are here you are never ever <laughs> going to be played out of position again for your country <laughs> but today i really need you to do a job for me at right back stephen gerrard yep i mean it'll never happen again so we don't have to worry about that anymore <laughs> uh, he also brings on gareth barry for his first cap as well in this game yeah Gareth Barry, the same man who Fabio Capello would be placing everything on for a World <laughs> Cup in 10 years' time. He's just rolled the dice and it's just all going on Barry, isn't it? It's all, all going the on ball. Barry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, could, I believe in him. He can do it. <laughs> just go oh, on, blow on this. <laughs> I suppose 10 years isn't that long to, between getting your first cap and being like the centrepiece of a World Cup campaign, but it's Gareth Barry. But it's Gareth Barry, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's strange, but I guess he's kind of in this... Um, squad at this period and around this time because English don't have any left footed players. Yeah. They're either all, all injured because I think I think Graham Lasso's injured around this time as well. I think Phil Neville is kind of his left back and he played in the Scotland games. But everyone else, this is the start of England haven't got anybody with a left foot. And if they are, you're playing left back basically. So who who was there before then if this was the start? Do we know? It would have been Stuart Pierce, but it was just like he's got yeah. two good feet. It doesn't really matter. But Stuart Pierce is 39 around this point. I think he played in some of the qualifiers. Like he came back as like emergency, we need someone. Yeah. And I think he played in the Sweden game or Poland game, one of the away ones. And seen as his last cap in 1999. But I think he debuted for England in like 87 or something. How much of um, Keegan do you think is in Mike Bassett? Because I feel like Keegan would have gone for the old players. I mean, the yeah. film came out in 2001. Yeah. So Keegan maybe was still the manager when that happened. Uh, or we may have, it may have been Sven. I think it would have been swearing around that time, but it would have in production. It would have yeah. been okay. Well, it's kind of key. It's kind of Taylor as well. It's them too, really. When you think of an England manager, they pick up bits all around, but it's just like, oh, it'll be fine. Just run it. It's the it's the um, Bassett thing, isn't it? Of like, oh, do you want me to go on, boss? Where do you want me to go? It's like, oh, you know, just get in the thick of it. Just do whatever you want. Yeah. Kind, of, just kind of thing. That's what Keegan would have done. Uh, we got one more game in preparation uh, against the powerhouse of football that is Malta. Malta, ranked 145th in the world, was England's final warm-up game. And it is as farcical as any game in this era, basically. I bet. I bet. Where, where was it? Was it another oh, travel to Malta? So it's in Malta, this is. And, and the stadium is just tiny. It's kind <laughs> of like they've just gone, right, you're going to have a week's break. Yeah, You're yeah. going to play this team no one really cares about. And that's what we're going to put it on the expenses as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Work. Yeah. Work expenses. Yeah. Um, Martin Keogh gave England the lead until minutes later when Richard Wright, on debut, uh, races out and concedes a penalty. 
David Carabo, I think that's how you say it, Carabo of Malta scores the penalty, but it needs to be retaken due to encroachment. They will not learn. They will not learn. Learn the rules, Malta. No one the 145th <laughs> in the world. No encroachment. Uh, Carabo takes it again. It hits the post and strikes Richard Wright on the head and it goes in 1-1. One, one. <laughs> Keegan. Oh, it's just all happening. It's all happening to Richard Wright as well. Uh, the game stays 1-1 one, one until the 75th minute when Emil Heskey scores his first goal for England to make it 2-1. And you think, great. Great. Keon and Heskey. Keon and Heskey. That's where we want the goals. The new from. men. The new men. <laughs> Michael Keon, um, make his de- Martin Keon, sorry, making his debut in 92, I think. <laughs> uh, incredibly, Richard Wright rushes out again in the game and concedes another penalty in the dying seconds. Uh, Wright saves this one from Carabao and the game ends 2 1. So, a busy debut for Richard Wright. Yeah. Richard, you're not going to make the call. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I hate to break it to you, mate, but I don't think I need to give you any reasons. No, I mean, this capped off a crazy week for Wright as well. He'd been involved in further shenanigans in the playoff final five days earlier. Uh, in the final, Wright scores an own goal when Craig Hignett's shot bounces off the bar and on his head and in. Uh, he also conceded a penalty, saved that one, but was unable to stop a second Barnsley penalty later in the game. He needs so in the, a break. So in the space of a week, he's conceded three penalties. <laughs> he scored two own goals and he saved... Two penalties, I think, as well. How many times does the ball hit his head? Twice. twice. <laughs> and it goes in twice, and it's counted twice as well. Oh, this Rich- is England's, like, one of their backup keepers. Richard Wrong, um, am I right? You are right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of our backup keepers. I mean, yeah. it's it's all looking... How, how, how do you feel? Looking to ahead to the tournament. My arse is going, if I'm honest. I don't like any of this. This is all feeling a bit horrible. Scraping past Malta and having your keepers to thank and blame for it isn't the best look, is it? No, it's not. Uh, let's have a look at Portugal then. Who? Yeah, who are they? Who are these guys? I had literally never heard of them, so <laughs> this is this is some research here. Uh, we've, had to, we've had to dig deep, but uh, apparently they did exist prior to this game. <laughs> they didn't qualify, though, for France 98, as you mentioned earlier. And uh, truthfully, they're, they're actually in danger of letting a, a really promising generation of players go to waste. Uh, leading the team through qualification for Euro 2000 was Luis Figo. Yeah. I mean, one of the silkiest, most creative players. Yeah, yeah. We got, Some we, consistent as well with that creativity. He's not a yeah. not mercurial type. And he's one of these as well today where maybe if you look just at his stats, which is all people ever look at these days because stats are everything, it's yeah. like... Oh, actually, a couple of goals in all these appearances and assists, but it's so much more that he did as well of kind of wearing teams down and creating opportunities for others as well. And we we kind of reach him at the high point of him being a footballer here too. Yeah. He'd been starring for Barcelona since 1995, but had originally signed contracts with both Juventus and Parma at the same time, uh, meaning FIFA banned the clubs from <laughs> signing him for two years. <laughs> Such a specific... Don't do that again. Don't sign him for two years. <laughs> you are banned. Going. And then, well, Palmer are going to go, can you make it two years and six months for Juventus? And <laughs> yeah. we'll just take two years. They're probably at this point just buy him anyway, because it was all this period where a lot of Italian football, you'd have players to be owned by two teams, mm. but they have a share. I always remember Adriano was one of them, wasn't he? Where he, he was like in part into part Palmer and he spent half a season at each. Mental. Yeah. I mean, what on earth were people playing at back then, really? Uh, in that time, then, over that two-year ban, Barcelona swooped in, <laughs> buying then loaning Figo back to Sporting Lisbon for the remainder of the season. More dirty tricks. Yeah. <laughs> Even then. <laughs> once he got there, though, once he got to the uh, the Barcelona, to the new camp, uh, he helped them to back. Uh, he helped them win back-to-back La Liga titles, back-to-back Copa del Rey, the Spanish Super Cup, a Cup Winners' Cup, and the UEFA Super Cup. Pretty much everything there, isn't it? <laughs> There's not really much more he can do there. No. Um, Portugal, uh, well, Portugal led by Figo and uh, Romania as well are seen as the, the two big swingers of the, their qualifying group for Euro 2000. Uh, their first head-to-head ended in a 1-0 win for Romania in Portugal thanks to a last-minute goal from Montino. I'm going with that as well. That's fine. Montino. <laughs> uh, if you're listening, Montino, get in touch yeah. if I've got your name right or wrong. At Is This England. <laughs> yes. Uh, they were back on track after that, though, Portugal, with a win against Slovakia, uh, seen as the third best team in the group. And they win the next four games, 7-0, 5-0, 1-0, and 8-0, until uh, they play Azerbaijan, where they need a 90th minute goal from Figo to rescue a draw. That's a back down to earth, that <laughs> yeah. is. You are nearly losing to Azerbaijan, and Figo's like, oh, for God's sakes, yeah. am I 
started doing everything. After now. that eight nil, they're just there smoking cigars <laughs> on the beach, and the gaffer's going, "You got to do some training." It's, it's like, yeah, you really think I got to do some training, mate? Because I think otherwise. <laughs> Azerbaijan, we just won eight nil. We won. We've scored about forty goals in the last five games. I'm having a cigar. I'm having yeah. a cocktail, and I'm chilling out <laughs> on this beach in Azerbaijan. Clearly. Uh, Figo's back at it again with an equaliser in Bucharest against Romania before rounding off the campaign with a 3-0 win against Slovakia but it is not Portugal who qualified top of the group no no it is Romania who f- who finished the uh, top of the group uh, actually qualified on 24 points uh, to Portugal's 23 but Portugal still managed to qualify as the best place runner up in all qualification seems a bit unfair as some of the groups only had 5 teams and Portugal's had 6 so yeah. there's more opportunity well, in that group to, to get points. points. Yeah, surely they would have done it on some system. I, no, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't think they did because. <laughs> but I think that the argument would have been, yeah, but you can lose points. But it's like, yeah, but I, we've got Hungary, Azerbaijan, and Liechtenstein in our group. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of wins coming there, isn't there? Liechtenstein finished with a goal difference of minus thirty-seven. Yeah, it's probably all just against Portugal as well. That isn't 10 it. Ten games. Oh, uh, so. I think things get a little bit stranger from there as well, as Romania and Portugal are both drawn in the same group together in Euro 2000. They are indeed, and they are in England's group as well. They are. Shock. Yeah. <laughs> Shock, Lister. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> in Insilla coming, did you? <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, there's, a, there's another team in that group. They're quite good. You may have heard about these ones, actually, back in the day when you were eight. Yep, uh, Germany, they were on the... The five, the five strong short list of teams that could be better than England yeah. in a game. So that's Keegan all over, isn't it? That group. Oh, bugger. <laughs> like two of the strongest teams in in Europe. He so would have been on holiday when he got that call as well, I bet. Yeah. Someone just came up to him, Mr. Keegan, the draw is in. Romania. Well, you know what? Actually. The, beat, the beats of France 98. Love to get a bit of revenge over them. Who's the second tier? Um, yeah, Portugal. They're, uh, they're, they were the best runners up. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a, they got more, more more than us in qualifying, didn't they? Yes, why well, didn't have to have a playoff? And uh, who's the um, who's the whipping boys then? That's that's the thing, yeah. Mr. Keegan. I think it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll not be a whipping boy. Tell me, Reese, spit it out, man. It's Germany. Oh. <laughs> He's like, oh, is, tell me it's East Germany. Can we yeah. have East Germany back? <laughs> Germany under 19s, is it? <laughs> oh, that is a tough, tough, tough group for They're England. Not, it's, it's Germany and it's the, the reigning European champions as Germany as well because they'd beaten England in Euro, Euro 96. 96 as well. So they got Germany who'd beat them in Euro 96, Romania who'd beaten them in France 98. Yeah. And, and a very good Portuguese and, team. I think if that happened now, I would I would be really confident of England not getting out the group. I don't. Yeah, England. It, it would have taken a lot of English press hype. Yeah, to make people think that this could be an easy group. I think it would have been. You've got to play them sometime, haven't you? But I, th- but I think even back then, I don't think people really took Portugal seriously because they hadn't been to France '98. I don't think they'd done great at '96 either, from from memory. Mm. And I think it's like there's a lot of players that play in that Portuguese league. Oh, that fee goes all right. Cost is all right as well. Well, yeah, I don't think we've ever had as hard a group as this in, in my lifetime. Maybe not. World Cup, um, was it 2014? That was really tough. That was Italy, Uruguay and Costa Rica. True. That True. was three former world champions in a group. Costa Rica? Oh, no, okay, yeah. sorry. I think we <laughs> you were forget playing... England being yes. world champions. <laughs> no, bloody Italy. <laughs> Rubbish. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right, so England's solid group is the setting, yeah. the backdrop, but we're looking at opening game. It's England versus Portugal at Euro 2000 at the Philips Stadium in Eindhoven on Monday the 12th of June. Roger Taines at the Philips Stadium in Eindhoven for Portugal against England in Group A. This is such a difficult group and such a tight game to call for a winner. England fans giving their team a fantastic ovation. Portuguese fans are behind. Euro 2000 then, yeah. a co-hosted tournament, which I kind of like. Yeah. We've got uh, USA and Canada coming up in the near future. I think Mexico as well. USA, Canada and Mexico. I, yeah. I really want to go to that World Cup. Oh, can we get free tickets? No. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> They're already in uh, Beckett's inbox, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd love to go to that tournament because it's just like, you know what? America should be hosting a tournament, especially when you get to go to like Canada and it's not been to Mexico for so, so long as well. 
Yeah. I, th- I think that's going to be amazing. I think it will be amazing. Uh, Euro 2000 was co-hosted by Belgium and the Netherlands. I'd go to that. I'd go to that. That'd that, be good. That'd be great. Local. Yeah, locally. So just you know, swim over there. You'll be all fine. Lovely beer, lovely time. Lovely and peaceful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, there have been concerns during the bidding process regarding Dutch hooligan culture in the 90s. And we're kind of led to believe it's just England fans who, you know, patrolled the earth, causing trouble at that point. But, you know, lots of footballing nations had problems. I mean, I think it was in previous Euros as well when it was hosted in Germany. I think the Netherlands fans have been seen as really aggressive as well so it's not just england fans that do this but they've been a worry beforehand <laughs> no but we, we are the standout yeah the gold standard <laughs> just get just just get handed like a giant gold bit of patio furniture <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh we're in the netherlands for this aren't we uh yeah eindhoven yeah. uh earlier in the uh in the in the day uh the group kicks off with a 1-1 draw with germany and romania so the winner of this game really has a lot to sort of, yeah, we can set ourselves apart from the pack here. Yeah, we can go top here, take an early lead on these are the these are the good sides that are in the group. So yeah, every game really counts at this point. Every point is going to count, isn't it? I'm getting I'm getting lots of nostalgia. Yeah, like just like oh come on, <laughs> opening game of a tournament, England. <laughs> it's opening night. It's opening night. <laughs> It's opening night and it's a scary opening night as well. Yeah. It's not like, okay, let's let's beat San Marino and then we've got a big game second. Yeah. It's kind of like, what order do you want them? It's kind of like, actually, would you want your first game to be the easier one because you can get it out of the way? It's well, not really an easier one. There isn't an easy one. In I this. would have probably even... Because <sighs> even Germany aren't that good at this point. You look at the mm. team of like, I think it was like, ni- when they won the World Cup in 90, they were seen as the best team in the world. 94, they weren't any really that great. 98, they'd gone out poorly as well. So you think at this point, you come to 2000, you think, all right, what are they? They're still Germany. And because of England and Germany's history, you still have to take them very, very seriously. Absolutely. Do you want to give us the England lineup? Oh, I get to do England. Go for yes. it. Right. In goal, we have David Seaman. Uh, we have a back four of Gary Neville, Tony Adams, Sol Campbell, and Phil Neville. Uh, four across the midfield, as Keegan likes it, David Beckham, Paul Ince, Paul Scholes, and Steve McManaman, and a front two of Michael, Owen, and Alan Shearer. Mm. Guide me through the bench. Uh, in the bench, you've got Nigel Martin, Richard Wright, he made the cut, uh, Martin Keown, Gareth Southgate, Gareth Barry, Stephen Gerrard, Dennis Wise, Nick Barnby, Emil Heskey, Kevin Phillips, and Robbie Fowler. Um, we say it a lot, but a mixed bag. <laughs> yeah, it's a very mixed bag. Uh, the only thing that matches really is the surname of the fullbacks. Yes, they come up a bit. Gary and Phil. <laughs> yeah, both starting the brothers for England. Yeah, um, great. I've yeah. said it before on the pod. I think when we looked at the Hoddle era, I'd love to have two brothers in the England team now. Yeah. Just a great thing. Um, <laughs> Phil, I guess at this point, was bursting onto the scene yeah i think he'd been playing really well um in like 96 97 and 98 but kind of as it got to like 98 99 he'd kind of fallen out of the man united team he'd he'd, he was still getting games but when you've got dennis Irwin and gary neville both doing a really high level he wasn't really making it in there but still seen as such a a, well the only left back basically england has so so not bursting onto the scene he's he's the only option we have he's the only one yeah i think like i said i think graham lasso is injured around that time i think barry's there as cover for him Stuart Pearce, again, is 87. Like, there's, you're not really sure what who else there could be at this point if England are going to play that formation. So uh, Shearer and Owen make the cut. Obviously, Shearer's going to make the cut. Undroppable yeah. Allen and uh, Michael, despite protests from <laughs> Keegan, is in there. Um, we've also got something matching the midfield, the two Pauls. Two Pauls. I've just have two Pauls in there. Paul Ince and Paul Scholes. I like that. Yeah. I think that's they're a good two, but as you kind of go through the England team, you kind of see something's not quite right. Paul Ince, we saw in the Scotland games, just kick the ball away like it was a bomb constantly. Yeah, true. But, but also be really involved in all the games and kind of like, all right, he's still really good at tackling. And yeah. kind of seen in 98, a career best performance against Argentina as well at Cena. So we're not too far away removed from that, but he is at Middlesbrough at this point and you do see his powers have left him almost. Yeah, it's that thing almost of... Um... I don't know, the, the the new millennium and it just like so a milestone like that aging a player. Because mm. when you look back at when he when he kind of started with England, 
even though it's only, what, X amount of years ago, I'm imagining six or seven, but when you go, oh God, it was like early 90s or something like that, you're yeah. like, that's a long time ago, it's 2000 now, baby. And it's also the kind of like... 92, he started playing for England. And, and you also think as well, like, like we said before, uh, decades kind of, they bleed into one another. You think the 80s looks like this, the 90s, 2000s, all that. Paul Ince at this point, you're like, 2000s Paul Ince? Yeah. And you think of him at Wolves or something like that, and they're kind of like the, when he was at the latter end of his career. But here you're like, oh, okay, early 2000? Was this just about passable? No. Not really. Well, that could be. Yeah, you <laughs> never, you never know. But again, keep, the, keep listening. The average age of this team is 27, and it kind of, you go, all right, everyone's at the peak of their powers. But then you've got all the Man United players are about 25, uh, Paul Ince is 32, David Seaman's 36, and Adams is 33. Yeah. So they're bringing that age up quite a lot there. Yeah, so the average age is 27, but I bet there's nobody who's 27. I don't think in the, that I, in the, in I the team. I don't think there is, actually, because Sol Campbell's quite young. Shearer, I think, is in his 30s. Again, the Man United players are 25. I'm not sure how old McManaman is. He's just like, yeah. I've never known how old he was at any point in his career. Could be 20, could be 30. Could be. Uh, on the bench, there's some interesting in players. I, I think uh, Kevin Phillips, Robbie Fowler, mm. uh, Stephen Gerrard as well. Martin Keown, who, who was quite impressive in the one of the Scotland games. Yeah, and he kind of, had, again, in that Malta game, I know it doesn't really say if he played well or not, but you kind of see Martin Keown around this era of, actually, should he have been starting instead of Tony Adams? Because Sol Campbell's just coming onto the scene as a, as a regular starter for England. He played it. I think he may have played left back. In, no, he played right back, didn't he, in one of, the, um, one of the Scotland games. Maybe both of them even. It could be club. Well, it should be club stuff as well, isn't it? Maybe yeah. Adams was playing at a higher level than Keon week in, week out for Arsenal. Yeah, true. Uh, a little bit of uh, an interesting story around the preparation for this game. Yeah, so uh, Keegan uh, in the prep foot had uh, had one of the England players who wasn't starting to play the Lewis Figo role for England in training. So kind of just have one England player in there floating about and kind of disrupting England, not being stuck down to one position. In like an 11 v 11 between the squad. Yeah, so you'd have kind of like the bench players and the starting 11 and they go head to head and it's just like, all right, let's have a, like a test game here. Let's just see how we how we do with a Figo-esque player playing against us. Yeah, so who was the player? Uh, it's not quite sure who it was. So this is a story from Tony Adams' book and he says that it was Kieran Dyer. But we don't think it can be Kieran Dyer because apparently he and Rio Fernand didn't get into the squad. So they were in Aya Napa on holiday. Mm. So maybe it was cut down. Maybe it wasn't exactly before this game. It was a bit in prep where actually maybe they had a squad of 32 or something. And maybe it was Dyer. Well, I mean, whoever it was apparently has uh, done a good job. Yeah, uh, this player, whoever it was, just ripped apart England and no one could pick him up. No one really knew what to do and they didn't have a plan for it and he just destroyed the England side. And and afterwards, Adams asked Kevin Keegan what their plan was to stop this happening in the Portugal game and he didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> what an amazing story. I mean, surely what makes Figo great is his individual talent, not just the role he's been given by his manager. It's not like you can just put somebody in that position and they'll just destroy you regardless. I mean, could it have been Gerard? Uh, maybe maybe like Nick Barnby because Nick, Nick yeah. Barnby keeps popping up and he always played number 10 quite a lot as well I think he'd scored in the qualifying campaign uh, as well why would Adams lie about Dyer? I don't think he lies I think it's just one of those things that maybe he's like forgotten about it or as I say maybe it was in um, before the squad was cut maybe but I think maybe it's just him misremembering really more than more than kind of him just going well it was Kieran Dyer and that was the end of it one thing about that as well when you go up to your manager and say uh, so that guy has just smashed us then in playing that fee goal role. Um, what's the plan to stop fee goal actually doing that? And your manager's response is, see you later. <laughs> I'm just off on the bus. Yeah, I mean, surely you must have responded more than there isn't one. There isn't yeah. a plan. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I mean, what, what do you know? You, you don't know, really. You don't know but, with but Keegan. Maybe yeah. it's just kind of, maybe he thought, okay, well, actually, maybe we'll, maybe it was just the hope of maybe we'll deal with Kieran Dyer or Nick Barnby and we'll be able to pick him up. But if not fee is doing that to England yeah. in a Figo role. Yeah. What's Figo going to do? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Terrifying. Quite terrifying. Speaking of terrifying, yep. Portugal's lineup. In goal, we have Vita Baia, the captain. Uh, defence, Abel Javier, Jorge Costa, Fernando Couto and Dimas. Uh, midfield, two of Vigdal and Bento. In front of them, we have Luis Figo, Rui Costa and João Pinto with Nuno Gomes up top on his own. 
Yeah, that is a, a great front four, let's just say that, isn't it? It is brilliant. Yeah, I, I said a midfield two there of Vig, uh, Vidgal and Bento, and I don't remember those at all. No, I think I think they just... yeah They're when just we doing the job. Yeah, do you remember I said like when Brazilians discovered they could make holding midfielders is kind of when football died for them. Yeah. And I think that they'd gone, okay, Brazil are doing this, we've just got some cloggers, and but they're good at passing the ball. Yeah. They've just got some you know, solid players. I'm sure they both had fine careers, but Mate. I didn't know who they were, and mm. they didn't really featured for me a lot during the game. I was just like looking at everybody else. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, we'll get to why. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, F- <laughs> Figo, Rui Costa, Joao Pinto and Nuno Gomez, that is, ooh, yeah. Rui Costa, man. Yeah, he was, a, he was a bit of a player that I never really, growing up, I think he'd, he'd started in the, not decline, but I only ever would have watched him on Champions League nights. He's a bit like a, a Gooty almost, isn't he? Where like yeah. I think time has been kind of coined to him and his and his role and what have you. I think so. I think it was just more me not really understanding what Arui Costa was. And by the time I was really watching the Champions League week in, week out, Kaka had kind of come in that AC Milan team. Yeah. So I was like, okay, Kaka is better than Rui Costa, this old bloke. even, And he's always looked about... 37 as well. He's the current uh, president of Benfica. Oh, is he really? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Good job for the boys. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, a big character in the team, um, aside from that front four, is Abel Javier. Yeah. I, uh, whenever I hear Abel Javier, I instinctively just think that of the clip when he's leaving Everton for Liverpool and uh, Gazza is hanging out of the window, tr- crying at the training ground, begging him to stay. Extend the contract. Um, I always said that I would like to stay in the club. I want your babies. Please. <laughs> Like Bless a, him. It's like a giant baby, isn't he? He's like a giant baby. Very much so. Um, I'd never seen that before. Really funny. And I love the headlines at the bottom. Ericsson says Shearer might make England squad. I'm pretty sure as well that it's, uh, Van Hal is interested in Man United yeah. job as well. <laughs> yeah, that was from 2001. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's what you think of him. I obviously thought of, if I think of Abel Xavier, it's the, it's the hair. Yeah, he oh, he's very recognisable, which we'll get onto in a second. <laughs> yeah, very dyed blonde. Um, Eyebrows dyed as well. <laughs> strong, strong move when you're clearly got dyed hair. A little bit further back, we've got Vita Boya in goal. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like he's a football manager, 98 legend. Oh, could be, yeah. I mean, I always just think of him as being one of like Mourinho's disciples from Porto in like four years' time. I think he was the goalkeeper for them as well. Yeah, he was at this point, uh, he was on loan to Porto from Barcelona. Ah, okay oh. then. So there England have got a, a top-notch keeper to face, uh, Vigdal and Bento, yeah. who who we you know we we are disciples of here, <laughs> uh, and yeah, uh, a, a strong Portugal team. Yeah, let's have a quick uh, chat around the kit then. Uh, England's uh, is it the same one as the '99 game? It is, yeah. It's still that in-between England period kit. I, I just don't like it. Again, I love it. It looks like it's been taken out of like a bag and you've not ironed the lines out of it. I just don't like it. Every time I see it, I like it more. Uh, Portugal's is nice. I like it. Nice I like and simple. Por- I, like, I like how dark the purple is on the Portuguese one and like the bright yellow goes really well with Xavier's hair as well. I love that. Let's get to the national anthems then. And I think before we talk about them, let's just hear a little bit of the England one. We look at the pitch, England supporters away to our right. And first, of course, the national anthems, starting with England.
oh, what the fuck? Well, what was going on there? So angry. It's so, so angry, angry at the start. It's just like straight away, it's like a goal's been scored or it's like a heel's just come out or something. It's it, everyone's just booing or cheering or just noise. It's um the start way too high as well. Mm. The start, an octave, like where they start singing is the, the highest point of where the song should ever go, <laughs> but they've, they've, only, they've got to go up. It's like in uh, I'm Alan Partridge when he sings close to uh, close to you on yes. karaoke. <laughs> Why do birds? It's too high. It's too high. It's too high. Bring it down. Yeah, and they, they can't bring it down. Uh, they've misjudged it. What they do though, about thirty seconds in, they get through like that first verse, and it feels like everyone goes, <gasps> <laughs> and they all just take a breath and they go and they go, oh, God, uh, and they start off again, and they actually get it right a bit. But the way they're screaming at the start was terrifying. I thought, yeah. One of the one of the worst uh, renditions. I enjoyed it, but I was safe from it. Yeah, <laughs> like, like me putting Resident Evil behind the settee. <laughs> it was just away from me, and I could then think about it. The uh, the commentator comments uh, during the Portuguese anthem on the Portuguese holding hands during their rendition in a way that you'd expect someone to comment on it in the year two thousand. Uh, oh, you just kind of like, oh well, look at them holding hands. I guess yeah, that's very. European. Yeah, <laughs> it would so be called European, not associating <laughs> us with being European either. Yeah. Pre-Brexit. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the Portuguese one, yeah, the, the, yeah, there's a line of handsome, tanned, dark-haired men, and Abel Xavier just pops up as well. He just, He's just unavoidable, <laughs> isn't he, at all points here? Yeah, he's made himself very visible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's made that decision to be vis- visible here. Um, I think we have a solo commentator stream for this game. We do. A guy called Roger Thames. I'd never heard him before and like, I don't think ever since either. I'm just like, I, yeah, I, I quite liked his voice. He was a bit Gary Lineker-esque, I thought. Mm, or Wayne Lineker-esque. I mean, I've never heard him speak. I mean, does he speak? Wait till he has to speak in court. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Give his statement afterwards. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, let's get into the game then. Um, England versus Portugal, Euro 2000. Uh, both teams from the start kind of go for it. There's crosses and shots of plenty, uh, quite high pace and not so much feeling each other out as seeing who can land the first punch. Yeah, it's kind of like at the start of like a, a boxing film that is so unrealistic where they're like, just like just throwing <laughs> yeah. their arms around and landing and everything. I mean, Figo is so tucked in straight away is what I thought. I thought he'd be right on touching on the, the, on the wing running at Phil Neville, but he's pretty much just playing as a number 10 alongside Rui Costa. That, not that Figo role then. Exactly. See, I've done the same thing as Keegan. I've gone in and gone, it's he'll play there, but actually if he comes in, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> I hope he's going to bloody move out right in a minute. <laughs> he scuppered me. <laughs> and we've barely had time to even sit down on the uh, patio furniture we were later throw around the streets of Eindhoven and we've scuppered Portugal. The two strikers given a free roll to mighty impressive number sevens out there. This is Figo for Portugal. But Manama looking to get a tackle in. And Adams took charge of the situation. Now it's with Phil Neville. Very much a right-footed player, but knocking that one with the left peg up towards Shearer. Shearer has Kuto with him. Support arriving now from Phil Neville. Goes to make the cross with the left foot. It's a decent one. Beckham will have to scamper across. Already looking up for the options in the middle and looks to deliver. That's a good ball, Eddie, and scores is there! And scores a score for England! England take the lead! Paul scores! The man who got them to Euro 2000 has got them on their way! Two minutes, 49 seconds gone, and Kevin Keegan has got the dream start! What a fantastic ball from Beckham! There was no marking on scores, and he put that one in off the ball! Consider yourself scuppered. Yeah, get back in your box. Skulls has scuppered them. There's your headline. Ultimate England goal, this. Yeah. It is a really good... (laughs) (laughs) It's three minutes. One day I'll be happy of an early England goal, but maybe today, maybe today is the one where we can go, you know what? It worked out. We're going to break the streak. Yeah, yeah, break the streak of it. Um, Yeah, as I say, ultimate England goal, really. Um, Warhorse Tony Adams makes a diving challenge to win the ball. Ince kind of like thrusts it towards Phil Neville down the wing, and he plays a a ball down the left channel to Alan Shearer, who holds it up and gives it back to Phil Neville. Uh, His cross evades everyone, and Beckham kind of has time to pick the ball back up. 
whips in her gorgeous standing cross right from the touch giant, and their skulls arriving late to smash the header home. Brilliant. So much microphone distortion from the comms. Yeah. It's like, Boss girls! Boss girls! <laughs> he says his name so much at the start of the game, doesn't he? Or well, throughout. I swear he says it about nine times just when he heads the ball. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Beckham, uh, he kind of just sits it up like a free kick, doesn't he? Yeah, he kind of has it like out on the touchline for a little while and he's just realised he's not being closed down. So he almost puts his foot on it and goes, okay, I'll just whip this in like it was a free kick. Why is Paul Skull so good at heading? Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's right, is no. it? No. Did but, he continue that through his career? Uh, I but, think he was always a good header. I think he's, he always his timing was always excellent of when to arrive in the box and to find the space as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, you, you you made a note that this goal was like everyone using the special moves. To, it, to, uh, it really is, isn't it? There's a big Adams block in there. There's an int kick away. <laughs> Shearer uses his strength. Beckham's cross and Skull's leap. It's like they've got a load of Power Rangers and they're forming a Megazord. <laughs> I just, I just love it. And and yeah, England, you know, Megazord is capped off by Paul Skull's having a, a great time. Even like three minutes in, he's been really good. And that sounds so strange, but two minutes before this, straight away, he receives the ball in front of the defence and Megs Rui Costa to get out of it. Um, he's definitely Keegan's man, isn't he? Yeah. I wonder whether the press made so much about Owen Beckham and Shearer and that, and whether it was left in the background or whether it was kind of, yeah, Keegan, he, he must, he must have fought of Paul Scholes as his main man. I think so. And it's maybe a bit of a different role than, um, he'd had under Hoddle. I think he'd played a little bit deeper under Hoddle with like a, with two people behind him as well. So he had license to get forward and he was good under Hoddle. But even in the games we've seen here, I think he, he scores a hat trick on, Keegan's debut, he scores twice at Hamden, he scored once here as well. And he just thinks, yeah. yeah, for some reason, he is the person that Keegan has gone, yeah, go out there. And he's you know, clearly he's probably his best England period as well in his career. Maybe, just maybe, that man can do a job on the left of midfield. <sighs> yeah, really want to scupper your England career now, don't <laughs> we, mate? And just stick you out there and don't worry about it. But uh, yeah, we also get a little shot of Keegan trying to remain calm as well, which is really nice and... He just kind of can't help himself, can he? He's just like, oh, you lot, what yeah. are you doing? It's all it, it's turning out all right on the night, three minutes in. Yeah, uh, England really haven't looked bad early door, uh, doors, but Portugal have looked quite skillful, whereas England looked calm and confident. Um, the game restarts and Portugal have the ball right in front of England's defence a lot. Yeah, it's really, really scary. And McManaman is kind of tucking in to try and help out his England teammates and it, it, it's not really working and it gets really scary for England in a minute. Rui Costa causing problems against Seaman. Stretching couldn't reach it. Oh, that was a real opportunity for Yao Pinto. Yao Pinto just couldn't direct it on target. What a great cross from Rui Costa. Seaman watching it all the way at full stretch. Didn't get it. And Yao Pinto was so determined to head the ball down that he took all the accuracy out of it. What an opportunity for the equaliser for Yao Pinto. Great goals in... Oh. I don't, don't... David, 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 David. David, <laughs> David indeed. Talk us through, David. Uh, yeah, a really nervy opening for David Seaman. He doesn't get all of the corner that comes in uh, and almost misses a cross, uh, well, also misses a cross from Rui Costa and somehow, Jao Pinto somehow heads it over and it doesn't go in. It's mind-boggling how he misses. Yeah, Seaman defies normal convention here and you know where they say making yourself big as a yeah. goalkeeper is a big thing. He makes himself short... Yeah, he kind of crouches and like yeah. like a little armadillo or Squashes something. Squashes himself in, yeah, like he's in a little <laughs> shell. Uh, just a few minutes later, uh, Seaman does make a good save from uh, Rui Costa, um, who is just playing the game like he's just floating all over the pitch. Yeah, it's like he's on a hoverboard at times and just running around England's team. I think him and Figo look like they can just decide, at, at, you know, you know, at the drop of a hat, mm. I want to do something ridiculous. Yeah, because they're just not being picked up either. The amount of times that no one stops them from running at the England back four either is terrifying. We're talking about England being 1-0 up and it wasn't long ago we were talking about the goal, but like Portugal have looked really good straight away. It's just like that's not even like they've not even blinked since then. They've just gone, well, let's just keep doing what we should be doing anyway. Let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing it. Here's Michael Owen. Old Beckham's made a great run. He's got many in the middle. He scores again. It's a second and it's Mark Mullerman. Steve McManaman justifies his selection in real style. 
It's 2 0 England. 17 minutes gone. Only Steve McManaman's third goal for England. And once again, it's the immaculate service of David Beckham. What a finish from McManaman. Beckham looked up. Superb crossing. Scholes looked and saw McManaman absolutely hammer that one past Vito Bayor. Splendid finish from Steve McManaman. And after a spell of Portuguese possession, England have struck for the second time. And look at the emotion there from Alan Shearer. Let's keep doing it! It's 2-0. <laughs> yes. The curse is over, baby. There's no such thing as two early goals. That's it. You can't score twice tw too early, can yeah. you? It's fine. 17, 17 minutes in. Steve McMahon and Man and McMahon. <laughs> Steve McManaman. Steve Mc <laughs> Steve Vince McMahon. <laughs> oh my God. Well, yes, we've seen uh, England start well before, seemingly every time and score early, early only to concede the next goal. But it's two 0 now. What more do you want? We've flipped the system. We've cracked it. We've cracked it. We need to score twice early. That's yes. been the secret we've been missing out on all this time. Of course. Uh, Michael Owen holds the ball in the right channel, uh, plays a lovely, uh, lovely pass into the underlapping David Beckham, who takes a touch and picks out McManaman at the far post, and he just strolls on into the roof of the net. The entirety of Portugal's defence are concerned with skulls, so McManaman has so much space he could raise a horse in it. Yeah. He's got a barn. Yeah, he's got a barn he's of space. got a space. stable. The entire Portugal defence just are like drawn towards David Beckham. And he is so on his own at Manaman here. And it's just like a nice first time finish into the top of the goal. Brilliant. Um, Beckham, delivery and passing range is insane. I think it was mentioned in the early throws of this game that Beckham was second in the Ballon d'Or. I think it may have been to Rivaldo around that time. But yeah. I, I think Figo wins it the next year. Yeah, props to Gary Neville too, whose long throw starts it all off. And a really nice inside pass from Michael Owen as well. Beckham kind of on the underlap. And again, that nice hold-up play that Keegan was hoping for soon coming off, isn't it? The commentator who loves Paul Scholes um, still has to mention him. Yeah, he, he just can't help it. The cross comes in, he gets too excited. He goes, Scholes is there again. It's McManaman! He just screams. <laughs> <laughs> the ball's from Beckham to McManaman. Scholes has got nothing to do with Scholes it. Scholes is there as well. <laughs> and look at Paul Scholes celebrating someone else's goal. And Keegan is loving it. He's waving. Oh, he's waving my at God. the players. I, right, lads. Oh, I love it. He's just so happy. Like, lads, I'm over here. Look <laughs> at this. He is so happy. It's like he's just found out that all of the England team have paid for him to go to Disneyland. Yes. He's like, oh, you buggers. Are we all going? Oh, I can't wait. He looks so cute, doesn't he? In his, in his lovely white England, uh, like, Jumper polo. Unblemished. Yeah. Unblemished Keegan. And again, he's like, he wears everything on those white sleeves, doesn't he? Yeah. He just can't help but go, this is the best time anybody's ever had. Ah, oh, Steve McManaman then. I think yeah. we spoke about him on a previous podcast. Yeah. Um, well, what's the golden era for him? Well, yeah. Got off to a good start in this tournament. Uh, he's referred to on comms as having hopefully solved uh, England's left-sided problem with that goal. I mean, yeah, early mention for that, isn't it? It's like, well, come on, just give him, let's give him... 15 minutes or whatever the goal um, this scored in. But yeah, he had a brilliant career at Liverpool and was a start of Real Madrid. But the way they're talking about him here is like he's some untested youngster. Yeah, why Why has he not solved the problem before? Well, yeah, like why has he not done it in like the game we watched? Why has he not been the constant player he's playing on the left as well? Like, I don't know if maybe he had like an injury or something, but he was still doing really well at Liverpool. He mm. starts the Champions League final and scores in it a few weeks earlier. Because it's not like we're talking about Ian Wright and going, great player, but there was always Alan Shearer there. Yeah, there's literally nobody <laughs> on the left wing. <laughs> England don't have a left-footed player, and he's not left-footed, but he's good enough on his left foot, and he's been doing it for Real Madrid and Liverpool. Yeah. What the hell, man? Anyway, Keegan's got it right. Yeah. Um, just after the goal, Portugal, right up, uh, Portugal go right up the other end and have a goal ruled out for offside. Who cares? Who cares about these offside goals? Keggy is off to see Mickey and Minnie. There ain't no stopping him now. <laughs> is there a better feeling than uh, being 2-0 up this early? I think with that cushion and you just go, we're yeah. all right, you know. You can really focus on drinking at that point, yeah. can't you, for a bit like, <laughs> I'll be like, 2-0 two, two up, I'll get, I'll get two points oh, so then. I'll go to the bar because nothing's going to happen. Don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> uh, that disallowed goal was, was was a really good goal as well. <sighs> yeah, it, it was a good goal, but, you know, offside or the, edge, or the end, but, you know, England are living on the edge at this point still. They've gone 2-0 up and... I'm still really worried when England, Portugal get the ball. This is not insightful um, footballing punditry or insight. Yeah. Uh, 
But Portugal are hitting their shots really hard. <laughs> like when they hit it, they really hit it. They're shooting from distance quite a lot and, mm. and whisping past the post or, you know, unsettling David team or whatever. They look dangerous. And and England are also, everything is always so, so rushed still at this point because Portugal seems to be so better. Everything has to be like a last ditch tackle like led to the first goal. Like Sol Campbell's just about getting in there and clearing it away. David Seaman's coming out and maybe getting something on the ball and just about clearing it. But yeah. it seems like the only player really that's got any sort of calm about them is Paul Scholes. There's a bit in this as well where he nutmegs another player and then just pings a perfect pass to Michael Owen over the top. And it's like a golf shot almost. Yeah. He is brilliant. And, you know, this game is, is certainly not going to be dull. He goes having to operate even more attackingly now. He really hits that one. Oh, that is just sensational from Luis Vigo. Seaman just stood and watched it and it flew in. Roberto Cueto is off the bench and applauding. That was a fantastic strike. Allowed to run out. Adams didn't close him down. It came almost between Adams' leg and it absolutely rocketed in. And even the great man Eusebio is on his feet acknowledging that was a magnificent goal. Adams decided to close him down through his legs and Seaman could only stand and watch as Portugal are back in it. All right, all right, listen, just don't. All right, just don't say anything, okay? It's fine. It's totally fine. Is it? It's fine. I'm not so certain. Why are you saying it's not fine? <laughs> <laughs> this is fine. It's just normal fineness. This is good, okay? It's. It, don't worry about it. Luis Figo with a consolation goal yes. for Portugal. That's, what that's all it is. That's all it is. He receives the ball in the centre circle, and for some reason, there is nobody anywhere near him. Mm. Uh, skulls and ints, England central midfield. Why are you shaking your head for? I thought it was fine. Nobody is near him. That's just it's just making me eat my head hot a little bit, okay? The England central midfielder, Skulls and ints, are behind him in the Portugal half, and Figo has the whole of England's half to run into. He brings it forward and s just smacks it into the top corner. Um... Uh, quite a little distance outside of the the, the uh, penalty area. Um, how is that goal not replayed ahead of every tournament and held up as one of the greatest moments of Euro's history? He's, he's standing mid, like central. Hmm. So he's not like curving it from the right to the left or what have you. He stood central, bang, top right. Keeper, I think, just stands there and drops to his knees. Yeah, I think when well, Seaman yeah, doesn't move at all. When you see the shot, he just it nestles in that top corner and he just doesn't move slightly. I told does you he? they were hitting it hard. That goal. Yeah. Isn't it a massive deflection? Um because the, I don't think there's ever been like proven whether it's an incredible goal or it just barricades off Tony Adams' legs. And I still don't really know. I guess because they were so close to each other, like Adams mm. was just putting in the tackle. It's not like it's been, the, the the course of it has been completely altered after it's been flying through the air a bit. I, if it's a deflection, he got in there early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Deflected it, which can obviously still change the direction of the goal. And I think it probably did. But, but I can't, there's a, there's a couple of angles where you go, oh, that's clearly hit him. But as well, you don't really see the ball leave Figo's foot. So maybe it flies through the air as well. Like, I, I just don't know. What it is, and I think maybe the uncertainty is maybe why you don't see that goal a lot because I think the story is Figo, essentially the captain, the best player. He stuffs one in the top corner, and they're away. Yeah, um, for me, I think I think back to Ronaldinho. Did he mean it? Mm. Um, was this a deflection? Because it's Luis Figo, I'm kind of inclined to think he just smacked it in. Exactly, and and I'm happy to kind of like be on that bandwagon. Really, if it is, I'm just like I. Don't know. I just feel a bit un uncertain at times with that one. It it looks incredible regardless. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. And and the fact that keeper doesn't move yeah. makes it even better actually. All right, so we're two one up. That's fine. That's why we got that extra goal. Yeah, that's what we said. That's why you got that extra point. Don't worry about it. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, all, yeah. we're all good. And uh, yeah, straight after the goal, Skulls has a shot over, and uh, Roger Thames on comms calls Skulls a pocket battleship, <laughs> which is uh, which is lovely. He also says he doesn't have a hot head for a redhead. Has he seen Paul Scholes play before? <laughs> and it's just like a child who's gone, he's my favourite, I'm yeah. going to support him. Can I tell you about Paul Scholes? <laughs> Do you know Paul Scholes did this? Paul Scholes is my hero. I saw a man today who looked like Paul Scholes. <laughs> he's not violent. <laughs> he was sli yeah. he's sliding in on another man, actually. He does love Paul Scholes. Uh, the commentator is, is annoying me. Really? Why? He, he explains everything. Like, it's the first... Like, I don't know what the audience was, whether mm. it was... 
I, I don't know. Yeah. Because he explains everything like it's the first time. Literally, he'll go, David Beckham on the ball there. Uh, of, of course, one of the most famous footballers. <laughs> if you didn't like, know that. We, we know that. <laughs> uh, at one point, um, just previous to the uh, goal, Michael Owen was one-on-one -on -one with Abel uh, Javier. And he went, Owen's got a lot of pace, but Javier is a defender. He's a defender. <laughs> He's a defender. I, I don't know. Is it like for people who don't know what England is? What football is maybe like they don't really, they only watch yeah. England at a tournament. Yeah. But even like if like he was a, de he's a defender. Well, other players can tackle. He gets some um, Gary and Phil Neville mixed up quite a lot oh, as well. So many times he gets them confused <laughs> uh, to the point where on. you're like, you've got to realize that this is happening. Like, well, or someone has got to be in his ear going, you've got that wrong again. Let me quote to you. I, I, I type this down word for word. Okay. Um, this was on a, a Neville mix-up. Skulls wide now for Gary Neville. So, skulls wide now for Gary Neville. Mm -hmm. Solid challenge there by the Portugal defender. McManaman wins it back and finds Phil Neville. Looks for his club mate, Phil Beckham. <laughs> Phil Neville there. This is Phil Neville. Rather, let's get the brothers sorted out. Well, it's definitely skulls. <laughs> <laughs> We know it's Skulls because he's his favourite. That's fine. Phil Beckham. This is Phil Neville, which is one of the great quotes of all time. I think we need to rename the podcast. I've, yeah. <laughs> it needs to be in England. Um, this, is this England merch t-shirt? This I think. is Phil Neville. This is Phil Neville. So let's get the brothers sorted out. Let's get them out. Like, it's just like, like consciously, he's just spewing it out. It's like, I, no, that's definitely someone in his ear that's going, what I mean. look, we've got to sort these, these brothers out. And he just goes, let's sort these brothers out. Like, like, like Vince McMahon's in his ear or something. And they something. go, no, you idiot. To go. Well, it's definitely Skulls. <laughs> I know skulls. And like, don't tell me I don't. Like he's not pressed the mute button or something. A couple of digs at Keegan he makes as well. He calls him a novice. <laughs> and he says, he's, well, he's a novice who's not done anything other than win the first division, which is the second tier in England. I love that. You've got to get that in there. The first division sounds good, doesn't yeah. it? But actually, it's not the top tier. For these expats living in flipping, I don't know. Saudi Arabia or, or something or like Portugal. that. Or Portugal. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't work for Portugal. I don't understand well, it this commentator. You, when you were eight, so. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, I'm still confused over which Neville's which. Yeah, it's 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 very odd, isn't it? But, yeah, he does have a few digs at Keegan in there. I, I didn't quite hear them first time round, so maybe I was just besotted with his love for skulls. I was like a, like a, like a hyperactive kid or something. He loves skulls, but at the, at the detriment of his love for everybody else. Oh, yeah, definitely. He's watching the game for skulls, isn't he? He uh, is a novice. A novice is harsh, isn't it? Um, yeah. The, the, back to the game. Yeah, there's parts of the game where Figo and Costa are everywhere. It's like they're just loaning each other the ball and there's no England player around him. It feels like cheating. Yeah. You know, we say like Kyle Walker is like cheats for England because he plays about three different positions. They're playing about eight. Yeah, I know it's harsh, but compare Rui Costa here to Ince. I know they're at different levels of the career, but... The mobility, creativity, and finesse are just levels apart. And if that if that's a central midfield competition, there is only really going to be one winner. One winner. And you and you do worry when you look at this England team as well, where you've got Paul Scholes playing centre midfield and he's streaming past into every opportunity and doing well in in that. But the problem is he's only got thirty two year old Paul Ince behind him. Yeah, and a lot of the time Paul Ince is high up the pitch as well. Yeah, it's like okay, I'm starting to see the problems in this England team a lot now. Yeah, and it feels like a 2-1 Portugal, they could just score at any moment almost. Is um We've scored twice too early, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Because we've scored too early many times. Yeah, I don't know about scored twice. I don't, yeah, I don't think no one, no one's ever said that. I think they said 2-0 is a dangerous scoreline. That's, yeah. That's the closest we're going to get, isn't it? Yeah, and I guess the earlier you, you get to 2-0, the more dangerous it is. Yeah, I mean, the difference in Portugal's midfielders and England's are that Portugal's midfielders are actually helping them defend. Yeah, yeah, but um, even Rui Costa isn't afraid to, to get stuck in. He's a bit of a leader as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, England's defenders look like they've never met the midfielders before. Rui Costa again, looking to pick their way with a quick ball through the England defence, which has to keep its organisation. Good ball into middle. That is a fantastic goal. And Yao Pinto has made up for that earlier miss with a far more difficult header. And it is 2-2. Two -two. And Portugal have really come back strongly. David Seaman may well shake his head. And you will wonder how the delivery got through and how he got in front of his man. Sol Campbell was a defender. Rui Costa, excellent cross. And it was a brave header as well from Yao Pinto. Getting in front 
of Campbell who tried to get his boot to it and angled brilliantly into the far corner and Portugal have hit back with two top quality goals 37 minutes gone Yao Pinto makes it Portugal 2 England 2 and a tremendous contest building up here in Eindhoven and Kevin Keegan who saw his team get off to an absolute flyer has now seen them pegged right back and this will be a real test of England's credentials I don't don't no it's fine Nick no we scored 2-2 two, two early <sighs> it's 2-2 two, two. right God's sakes. You let me get excited, didn't you? I got carried away. Keegan got carried away. Maybe. Mate, his face is not happy at all now. 37 minutes and it's 2-2. Two, two. Uh, some sustained possession for Portugal as they just loan the ball to each other, as you say. Mm. And they're just wearing England down. Constant passing and moving. England are chasing the ball. Uh, they don't get to it and then shrug back over to where they've just come from. Uh, after the pressure, they're just waiting for that little gap to open. It's a simple cross, uh, cross from Rui Costa. And Pinto comes in and scores an outrageous header into the only place he could put it high, then dipping low into the far corner. A uh, great header. And yeah. Like, like, yeah, England were just truly worn down. They the jockeyed and stayed close to the man for so long. But Portugal was waiting for that one moment. They could keep that ball all day. Yeah. One of you is going to be out of position soon. There's never enough. There's never enough pressure, but there's enough that England are going, right, I've got to move along and because this is my space, I've got to occupy it. So they haven't really got a pass going. And then all of a sudden, it's just like you see that one extra pass that goes to Rue Costa and you almost see Scholes, Neville and McManaman, I think it is, all three of them kind of like slump. Yeah. And they go to go and try and close him down, but it's already happened. They've already kind of missed that opportunity. And yeah, England in the build up to the goal, like they're kind of like they don't know what they're doing and there's nothing to it. Straight away, you hear the atmosphere has changed as yeah. well. Like, Portugal fans are louder, and the England ones are probably are too, and they're loud, but for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Happy times for Portugal, though. Yeah. No, no less than they deserve, really. No, not at all. They, I think David Beckham wrote in his book by saying that even when England were 2-0 up, he was really worried because of just how easily they were cutting through them. But I really enjoyed this bit because Portugal's manager looks like a cute little teddy bear. <laughs> he does. He looks like a friend of Paddington. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can almost like imagine him in a little train conductor's hat, <laughs> like like you know being set, sits up right for the first time, and it's just like I thought he just looked lovely. Yeah, uh, the half continues. Then that was thirty-seven minutes. That goal. There's a few troubling signs. I think England may be uh, losing their heads a little. Maybe they need a bit of calming down at half time from Keggy. Oh yeah, Keggy's the person to calm you down <laughs> at half time and give you like give you what for is it? Yeah, skulls in the box um, as the cross comes in and it's cleared to Ince at one point. He heads it into Luis Figo and basically in one pass they are running at England again Portugal are and it's just like your two midfielders there one's in the box one's giving it to Figo and it's just like something has to change here certainly it's 2-2 and it could be way worse and you were 2-0 up in 15 minutes yeah one of the last action uh, pieces of the half England get a throw in they take it long into the box but what is notable is that 37 year old Tony Adams has come up for this a, a a throw in, yeah, two two, right on half time. You're just trying to get to half time and look out there, and they've thrown Tony Adams forward at God knows what age he is, as you say, thirty seven, I think. And it's just like calm down, everyone. Well, we can calm it down because we get to half time two all, oh. four goals in the first half. Somehow it's two two. I know it could have been four nil. Yeah, but but England kind of like they have enough chances like early yeah. in the game. I think they just lose their way after a while and go, crap, it's just happening to us now, isn't it? I think that they're, they're um, scary. Like the, the Rui Costa and Vigo thing is just scary and, and they aren't really they aren't ready for that. And you couldn't really say that any of the Portugal players really stood out apart from them too, but everyone else has done their job to the degree where you've got, yeah, they've been really solid actually, even though in the first fifteen minutes they kind of lose their heads and concede two goals out of Errors, kind of like you wouldn't really say the skulls goal is an error, but the man and one where they just leave him alone is, is unforgivable, really. Can this England team under Keegan do anything other than score a couple of goals in quick succession and just hope that nothing happens to them? Because that's what happened against Scotland. We, we stretched that over two games. You mean like positively? What do you mean? As it, well, they can do lots of other things, like concede lots of goals, can't they? Oh, like, no, to win a match. Like, all they can seem to do is go at some point, yeah. whether it's this game, whether it's another game. Yeah. 
we're going to score two goals in quick succession. Hopefully that happens at the right times for us. And yeah. then we just have to defend. It's like a bit of a blitz for England, maybe. Like they just do a quick blitz and then they're off. But all of a sudden you just think there's no control. Yeah. There's no setup. Like everyone's just panicking. Ideal time, nil, nil. Blitz happens in the 90th minute. I mean, Keegan would still end up losing that game, wouldn't he? Bless him. <laughs> he just wouldn't put it past him at all. Let's get back into the second half then. Oh, God, I thought we didn't really relax enough there. <laughs> imagine, imagine, but like being our age now and this being half time and then coming back out. In 15 minutes, just like, oh, they're already out. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can already see the furniture going in the distance. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's getting closer. Oh, and um, young me would have been incredibly disappointed to see that Michael Owen was taken off at half time. You, how would you have even like? Exp- how would anyone would have explained that to you? Yeah, for Heskey. Yeah, for for Emil Heskey, and you know, Owen at this point, his confidence is on the floor with England. You know, Ke- Keegan and he didn't really get on, and as we said in the middle of a meeting, they'd kind of had a big bust up as well, and he just didn't really know what to do with Michael Owen either. And he, I think, when he went to Newcastle. He almost turned him into a bit of a midfielder as well. So he's still got this bee in his bonnet about it then too. Yeah. The half starts with an outswinging corner and Seaman comes for it. It misses Nuno Gomez's head. Seaman still doesn't reach it. And he's basically sideways, like on the floor almost as he's heading down. Yeah. And, and somehow it, it hits Pinto, I think, and it goes up in the air and it misses. The still I put in of Seaman, how is that the goalkeeper? He is on the floor, on his side, like l- flying towards the floor. Yeah, just unbelievable. He must something must have happened because he's just looked so unconfident at crosses. Well, I kind of read as well that there was um, a Spanish writer afterwards. This game wasn't really too kind with David Seaman. He said that he comp- he compared him to just some meat with eyes. <laughs> What? <laughs> yeah, apparently they just said he wasn't a goalkeeper. He was just more some meat with eyes. I'm seeing a pepper army. Yes. You know, the pepper army off the adverts. Oh, I don't know. I'm seeing a side of ham, I think. Oh. With a tash. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, well he makes I himself... I can imagine ham having tash. He makes himself so small, as you say, throughout yeah. everything here. It's just like all of his goalkeeping training has just flown out the window either. Jesus. And, and England are hanging on from the 46th minute there, yeah. really. Uh, um, there is something positive, though. Go on. Alan Shearer has absolutely nailed the skill of receiving the ball wide near the corner flag, holding off the opposition player, turning inside, playing it off the player, and winning a corner. He is the best in the world at that little bit of skill right yeah, there. Yeah, that's, that's what you need. Because he does that so much in this game, and that, you <laughs> feel like that's the only thing he kind of contributes. Like, I don't think he's terrible, but he's just not in it. No. Such a shame for, for uh, Shearer so far on this show. I know, yeah. I mean, Shearer had already announced his, his retirement from international football prior to this tournament as well. So it's a real <laughs> conundrum of what they do, you know, and, you know, for England and how to win corners. It's is, okay, though, because he's going to do it. Is that a really big-headed move? I'm going to retire after this tournament. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't think so. The only reason you think so is because Shearer's at this point with England where actually he shouldn't be going... His body won't let him go to all these internationals and play for England. But just... Know that you're going to do it, say it to Keegan, mm. and then do it after the tournament. Keegan would not be able to have kept that in his bonnet, would he? <laughs> just, I know something you don't. Just at the press, guess who's retiring? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ask me. Well, his name, his initials <laughs> begin with A and S. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you who it is. Right, you got to guess. It. you got to guess. Right, it's A Shearer. Uh, so, sorry, uh, so Alan S. <laughs> <laughs> it's Alan Sugar, not Sugar. <laughs> Bloody yell. Anyway... Um, yeah, so Shearer's there winning these corners. I don't, not much is happening from them. No. Um, and yeah, he's announced his retirement. I think, I think it's a bit of a big head move. Yeah, possibly. It guarantees him playing as well with somebody like Keegan. I think, and that's that's the, maybe the reason why he's done it, because he's thinking, actually, because I think in the build-up, Andy Cole had been, like, in the form of his life for Man United, and he and, he and Shearer had fallen out in, uh, around the Scotland game, and they'd publicly kind of made up. But you look at the players that were on the bench, Kevin Phillips had won the golden boot, uh, the European Golden Boot. Yeah, you look at Robbie Fowler. I think he's he's maybe a bit of a fading force at this point because because Owens come on the scene. Heskey has either moved or about to move to Liverpool as well. They had I think there was Littman around then for Liverpool too. So they had good strikers um, Liverpool too. So, but yeah, and you kind of think, well, who else is there? Go- is there going to be? I mean, Sheringham's not even in the squad at this point either. He's disappeared. So you think the Kevin Phillips thing though. God, how do you how do you have that good a season win the European Golden Boot at a newly promoted team? Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, still 
you've got to force your way into the starting eleven. I think with with a season like that. I think he'd. I think he. Keegan had tried him out quite a lot in the friendlies. I just think it was one of those things where he just never really worked out for him. His England career, maybe where he got. I think he won like eight caps. I want to say. And I think Andy Cole maybe even won, maybe he had a few more than that. I think Cole's the big one. I think he may have been injured going into this tournament. I think Ray Parler was too. And you think mm, maybe in another universe, you think Andy Cole and Michael Owen, that's a good strike partnership, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, Phillips is on the bench and England uh, need to look to the bench now because Steve Vince McManaman Manaman <laughs> from earlier, who we all got so excited about his name, uh, he is being stretched off. Yeah, he's being stretched off. And one of the guys that is carrying him off looks like some middle American six-part true crime documentary bloke, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks terrifying. Definitely, definitely. I can imagine him sitting on the porch with a shotgun. Yeah. Going, I don't regret nothing. <laughs> yeah, for some reason he's not in prison at this point in the Netflix documentary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah he's soon bought off for Dennis Wise. Dennis Wise who I didn't know, who had a little spell out on the left. I didn't realise that he'd done that. No, he seems more of like a a CDM. Yeah, combative midfielder. Yeah. You kind of hear, you hear people like talk about him and go, actually, he was a lot better than that. Like, you know, people are, are very revisionist about Vinnie Jones. We go, well, actually, he didn't just kick people. He was very good on the ball, actually. Mm. And I'm just like, well, maybe. I don't know. I've not watched enough Dennis Wise. All I knew growing up, I may have even watched this game or one of this of this tournament. Not knowing a lot about football. I remember my dad going, yep, get Dennis Wise on. That definitely meant he needs to kick people, basically, <laughs> if my dad liked him. Well, let's hope he can, because England need to, to get a bit of life into this game for, for them now. Just let's stop being passengers. Yeah. Let's grab this game by the scruff of the neck, and let's take it to Portugal. England then, two substitutions. One of them enforced. Presumably the other was tactical. Wise will go straight into that left-hand roll. And there's a gap in Nuno Gomes. That's 3 2 Portugal. And they have come back big style. 2 0 down, 3 2 up now. And it's Nuno Gomes, the man brought in to replace Sapinto, who's come up with the goods. It is his first goal for Portugal. And he sent his supporters absolutely wild. And England trailed out. They were left short again. Adam's trying to get there, but Nuno Gomes really thrashed it home. They were left a man short at the back again, England. Adams could not get there. Gomez, top finish that. He only appeared twice as a substitute in qualifying, but he's come in and he is absolutely ecstatic about that. The 23 year old in his 13th international has dealt a really unlucky blow to England. Portugal three, England two. Coming up to the hour marker and a fantastic response from Portugal after going two down in the first 18 minutes. Fuck! <laughs> you cannot deny it any longer. <laughs> the inevitable has happened. <sighs> right, yeah, it's happened. Portugal are winning. It's Nuno Gomes and, it's yeah. before an hour into the game. Before an hour, we've had... Five goals. Five goals. England have threw away a 2-0 lead. Portugal probably could have scored six, if I'm yeah. honest, at this point. Uh, do you want to run us through the goal? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, if I have to. Uh, se seemingly out of nothing, if you can call it nothing, in Portugal's had the entire ball the whole half. Uh, Rui Costa, again, in loads of space, with Skulls chasing him and Ince not picking him up. Uh, he just kind of swims through the midfield, doesn't he, here? Uh, Costa has four England players it kind of in his slipstream chasing him and around him. And he plays the perfect ball into the box for Nuno Gomez, who's between Adams and Gary Neville. It's a good touch from, from Gomez. Uh, he kind of plays it into his path and through doing so brings David Seaman out. Like the touch is so good. Seaman thinks he's got a chance of getting there. And before he can even get near it, he just kind of thrusts it into the top corner. What a goal. Yep. Nuno Gomez, not a tap in. Not to tap in at all, is it? And uh, I think it's his first goal for Portugal as well. I think the commentator says too. Well done. So annoying. That's like a football manager. Oh, it's his first goal for the club. And you're like, oh, sod off. Not against me. I've got nothing else to add. We no. threw it away. Yeah, it's... it's... How are we going to get back into this? <sighs> Dennis Wise is on though. Yeah, Michael <laughs> Owen's not. Michael Owen's not on. Dennis <sighs> Wise is. The goal scorers come off. You've got Shearer just winning corners. <laughs> For, for, for Dennis Wise. <laughs> I'm doing my bit. Yeah, come on, lads. 
Um, right then, let's let's move forward then. Yeah, uh, yeah. We get a glimpse of what isn't quite final form. Uh, Sol Campbell, as we'll see in uh, the years as he moves to Arsenal, he dives into a challenge and misses it. And Portugal are just again streaming forward like the, the beige arrows on <laughs> yeah. me at that point. Not beige. They're um. Well, that's what I feel like. like a my, b- burgundy. Yeah, my eyes have just gone all soft at this point. I can just. <laughs> bet, I'm bet, I'm looking at it through my own fingers when I'm watching this game back. And aside from set pieces, I'm really not sure what England are going to do. I mean, Shearer's is winning them, mm. but it even feels like nothing else is happening like that. And it already feels like the 89th minute. It's around 60, 70 minutes at this point, but it feels like England have just gone, shit, just get the ball forward. This is panic stations here. And it's just like, just calm down for a minute. Maybe start trying to pass the ball again like you did in the first half. Give it to Skulls. Skulls has been good. Uh, yeah, England need a bit of spark. Uh, they need something to create a... Uh, Beckham is getting the crosses in, and one of them does go to Skulls. Gary Neville again with the throw. Adams able to knock it on. Skulls is there! And again, they got the block on. They defended in numbers, and they've been really strong at the back after that awful initial mistake that allowed Paul Skulls to get in there in the second minute. The Portuguese defence has really tightened up. Phil Neville this time is going to try and emulate his brother with the long throw. Decent height on it. Oh, Adams missed it. Tony Adams had a real chance. He came up there. They're off the bench for England. Emil Heskey got his head to it. Tony Adams couldn't get his boot to it. And Scholes and Shearer tried to react, but neither could steer the ball on target. Scholes, Shearer had a touch as well. It just... Couldn't get up. Oh, that's, that's such an England chasing a lead chance, isn't it? That I know, yeah, it, yeah. It does seem to kind of like there is a bit of a spark about them, as you say, at this point. And you know, there's a flick on from Adams. Uh, it's into the path of Skulls, who kind of has a shot blocked, um, and it looks like it was going in. And it's Alan Shearer who's blocked it. And you just think, oh, for God's sakes, this really is England, isn't it? And then yep. from a different opportunity, uh, one of the Neville brothers, who knows. Uh, throws it in, it's kind of flicked on. Adams is steaming into this, like like just on a really brisk walk that he's going on. <laughs> and he somehow misses it. Paul Scholes jumps, heads it, and it just goes wide and close-ish yeah. from, from England. I think that's kind of one of the more lively chances England do have, really. <sighs> yeah. I'm just really disappointed in this lot. Yeah. But I should have known better. Should. That Scotland game. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe the, your memory had softened after that Scotland game. Of, oh, well, we went through. Yeah, you know. and then uh, such an exciting start to this game. Yeah. Uh, while causing chaos in Portugal's box with his gentle dad run, uh, Tony Adams actually injures himself. Yeah, and he's bought off from Martin Keown. Nine minutes to go, and Keegan's gone, well, we've got to keep what we've got. <laughs> which is losing. Yeah. And not going, or well, maybe you can just Kevin put, Phillips. Well, yeah, Kevin Phillips is sat there. Robbie Fowler's there. I mean, I know there's not great midfield options. Even Steven Gerrard just to, to do something. Is Kevin Phillips the guy, um, it is Kevin Phillips, is the, that meme that was going around, the commentary thing. Yeah. What song is he singing it to? Oh my God. Let's find it and put in a clip. Little aside there, oh, yes. the classic Kevin Phillips song, but he's not coming on. No. It's Martin Keown. Martin Keown's come on, and you just think, what's the point? Yeah. But you do you do get, as Adam comes off, apparently he's going to take over the captaincy from Alan Shearer after Shearer retires, 
<laughs> he is 37 years old. Are we really going into Japan and South Korea with 39-year-old Tony Adams leading us out? David Beckham's there. He's just there. Yeah. Just give it him. He's the second best player in the world. He's 25. <laughs> yeah, he's in his prime. Just give it to him. <laughs> like, the, I, I imagine him being stretched off or what have you, Adams and Keegan going, don't worry, <laughs> even if you don't play any more in this tournament, you'll be my captain next time. Just, and just give him like a handshake. Don't worry, lad. Just be, yeah. be fit for a couple of months. And Adam just looks at him and just goes you really think that's fucking happening <laughs> we're not getting out of here man what the hell what the hell <laughs> uh so that's our hope yeah. we have martin keown on can he do anything no that's it that's the final whistle it's a tremendous result for portugal to go top of group a a magnificent return and a great comeback as well the two coaches salute each other but the celebrations are all portuguese Luis Figo inspiring a tremendous comeback. England were 2 0 up after 18 minutes, but Portugal never wavered. Their football, the quality of their midfield play came through. Luis Figo got one back, a tremendous shot. Yao Pinto, another star man, leveled. It was 2 2 after 37 minutes, and Nuno Gomes was the man who was on spot to give Portugal the advantage. The two keepers. There in conversation, but by far the happier night for Vitor Boyan on his record-breaking appearance. England, a real disaster for them, but the celebrations of Portugal. Portugal 3, England 2, the full-time result. Disneyland's off. Disneyland's off. We're it's not, all off. We're not going. It doesn't get any easier either. We've got no. Germany and Romania <laughs> to come up. This was supposed to be the easier one. We started so well. Yeah, we so, did. So, well, and it all just went from gold to shit. Yeah, <laughs> the peep show. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like England. I mean, we'll get to is this England later, but yeah. it feels like England summed up. Yeah. You could you could say that game is like the next twelve years of England. It really is, and it's new ways of kind of buggering it up as well. Um, we we've kind of got to touch on this at full time as well. Really, um, as the game finishes, England players and David Beckham in particular are subjected to what Keegan describes as the worst abuse I've ever heard by their own fans as well. Shocking. I mean, I mean I'll mean, i run through what happens here, but this is awful. So during the game, Beckett had been subjected to abuse from sections of the England fans, shouting their hope that his children would die during the game. Just... Where do you even start? I mean, that that's why people don't like football fans in general, because yeah. they're just so quick to just be like, this will hurt this person. And it's his own... Fans, he's played really well in the game. What has he done yeah. that deserves this? It must be just because he's taking corners and they've just picked on no, him. No, it's because he's David Beckham. Well, it's it's that, but I mean, like in the vicinity of just getting lots of abuse. Um, no, nah, he, he it, it's all because of how he looks. Yeah, and how popular and famous he is. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't disagree with that either. Really. Um, yeah, a, a full time Beckham came over to clap the majority of the England fans. And when the section of fans started abusing him again, he gestured back to them, sticking his middle finger up. Good on him. Yeah, I never understand um, how it's seen as shocking for players to react to the vile abuse they get. No. They've screamed at him, I hope your kids die. He stuck his middle finger up. I think they're still very much winning in, yeah, in, in, that the, set. in the abuse game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if you, know, you get points for the severity of your abuse, it's probably about 90 to 1. Um, but yeah. It's... it's I, w I wish he could have done more. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I wish he could have chucked some patty off. And yeah. Them. <laughs> See how you like it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just starts bringing out all these chairs to him. <laughs> just lining them up. Which one would you like, sir? Uh, it, yeah, so it's, it's a grim atmosphere at the end. Once he and the rest of the players started coming off the pitch, they were again uh, hurled with abuse. Uh, so much so, the FA requested the tunnel covers back to the dressing room should be opaque instead of transparent for the rest of the tournament. I mean, stopping like England fans from basically being able to see your players as you come <laughs> through is just uh, awful. And like, uh, why support them for ninety minutes and then do that? Yeah. This is what I mean by the pits of culture. You yeah. kind of got this stage where people just think I can be aggressive and horrible, and there's no consequences, and I can just do it because I'm entitled to. And it's just awful, awful, awful. Um, earlier in the game, there were eight to ten England fans shouting at the team and were deemed unprintable by the press. What they were saying. Uh, Keegan said, I take my hat off to the players that they didn't react more strongly. It was the worst thing I've seen in football. I've had plenty of abuse in my time, but this was way beyond anything I've heard. Abuse is something we all have to put up with at times, but there is a limit to what every human being can take. 
and it got way beyond that limit, I think I would have struggled not to react. Keegan was quite visibly shook by the events and continued um, um, to say it wasn't just to David Beckham, but to quite a number of the England players. And if you'd have heard that abuse and you'd have had to take it, your sons or daughters having to listen to that, it started at halftime, uh, but obviously it got worse at the end and it's got nothing to do with football. It was very, very personal. We're talking about eight to 10 people who have got an England badge with three lions on and I don't understand them. I'm not going to try and understand them. I don't even know whether I want to understand them. Uh, the majority of our fans are fantastic. We mustn't think that these few mindless ones should undermine what was a fantastic performance by our fans. He finished by saying about Beckham, if David is getting even half of what was said in Eindhoven some days of his life, I think he handles it fantastically well. Yeah, I mean, Keegan couldn't have really said. He doesn't like, oh, well, you know, it was only... He doesn't just kind of say it's only a couple of people. He damns them almost on behalf of England fans as well and on behalf of the team too, rightly so. Yeah, um, probably one of the... Better managers to have in post to respond to that and support the players. I think as much so. as like I think all managers would have took the players' side, but you probably really would have felt that Keegan was on your side if he's there and talking so quickly without a PR filter. Yeah, uh, you know, straight after the game, um, and and he's focusing on sticking up for his players, and that says a lot about him. It says a lot about our fans, but we've covered yeah. this a million times. I know, and that's the thing. It's that section where you just think, well, horribly, you represent England, the worst of England and England fans as well, don't you? And, yeah, it was just awful. And Beckham does speak about a lot about how actually Keegan helped him through this period too, a lot with England, and kind of made him think, you know what, I, I should be still playing for England as well. Um, Beckham loved that Keegan had his back and supported him after his response to these morons. Uh, Beckham said it was Kevin who gave people an idea of how far the abuse had gone. No player could have asked for better support from a manager. Keegan was prepared to stand shoulder to shoulder with me. Of course, there was a big fuss in the next day's papers. He's an idiot, a disgrace, and should never play for his country again. But this time it was different. I had the England manager behind me. I believe attitudes towards me changed. I'll never know how important Kevin's backing was, but I really believe that events in Eindhoven finally helped people realise what I had been through. So is this still laying, um, playing back to France 98 as well? Yeah, and it's, it's all that and the burning of the effigies. And, and you do look and you kind of go, well, because Man United was so successful at the time, Beckham's the person who's got you know the celebrity wife and all that. It's kind of like, well, it's all these things combined, isn't it, into one thing of like, well, look at this pretty boy and, you know, oh, my girlfriend fancies him, so I ate him and all this moronic stuff as well on top of everything else too. And in in fairness, actually... The press were very good with David Beckham after this, and they actually backed what he did too. Yeah, um, there was a, a a campaign from Sunsport. Yeah, called Layoff Bex. I mean, you've already done your part there, haven't you, son? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you can't really go back and it. Whoa, whoa, whoa! It's only cool when we do it. That's kind. Of, yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, they uh, they said now is the time for every football fan in our country to get behind David Beckham. Our message to every England fan following this team is: root out these morons. <laughs> The sun. Yeah. Oh, my God. If Root you, out our readers. <laughs> if you hear them shout this stuff, report them to the authorities, or better still, drain out their bigotry with pro Beckham chance. It's not better than than reporting them, is it? I know, yes. Like, you you, you want both, but... Yeah. Uh, but, but, but well done on actually stepping up and saying something at that point, because they easily could have gone down the route they'd done two years earlier and just been like, yeah, what a prick. God... Grim after one game. After one game, that's the thing. And it's in the way that England had played well and it and uh, points and then took a lead and thrown it away. And the fact that it's happening at half time as well. What hope did the England fans have by doing that? Did those fans wouldn't have cared if they won or lost, maybe. I don't know. I think I think it's that thing still of again, this is my this is culture of like I've put everything into this. I've I've paid my money to I think they even say in that Woodstock documentary, I've paid X amount of dollars to be here. I'm gonna do my own thing, aren't they? Oh god. Uh the mirrors front page carried the vile insults, uh, which provoked Beckham, where it's uh editorial called on the majority of England supporters at the competition to shame the vile cretins who hurt Bex. Mm. Hurt <laughs> <laughs> so just just uh, takes a bit of weight off if you call him in, by his nickname. I know, yeah. It wasn't universal uh, praise for Beckham uh, with former Labour Party deputy leader Roy Hattersley writing in the Daily Mail accusing Beckham of becoming a national liability, 
stating the problem with Beckham is that he wants all the benefits of wealth and fame without any of the responsibilities. My blood is boiling. My blood is boiling Just listening to that. Just like, it's as he not, he's clearly like not watched the game, not a football fan, not anything to do with it. And he's just gone, oh, it's Beckham doing things again. Isn't it like he did in bloody 1998? What, what responsibility is it to be shouted at and told that um, we want your kids to die? Like, yeah. who you, signs up for that? Oh, you've got to be above that because a role model. Well, a role model is actually stepping up to that kind of behavior and exactly. going, you know what, that's not acceptable. He wants all the benefits of wealth and fame without any of its responsibilities. His responsibilities for that wealth and fame are turning up and playing for England and giving it his best shot. Yeah. That's it. Uh, if the fans want to be angry, then they can have a right to be upset with the team. Yeah, absolutely. But to do to get to take it that far in this period as well, is just kind of, you start to see the toxicity around the England team at this point. And by going, so much was expected at France 98. Ke- Keegan's come in and it's all kind of like started slipping away ever so gently. And you just think, ah, we've got and it's two games to go. England have lost the opening game and that's what's happened. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's stop it there for a bit then. Yeah. Uh, was this England, Nick? Yes. I yeah. mean, on all accounts, isn't it? It's blockbuster, but mostly rubbish from England amongst the pits of culture. Yeah, big old shit show, outclassed <laughs> while creating a horrible scene of ourselves that is completely unnecessary. Uh, talking, Talk about flipping ending on a deflated note. <laughs> you know, even even Keggy can't make me smile at this point. Um, Let's just look back at those photos of him when he was smiling, when he was going to Disneyland. That, I think just look at that on the way home and go, you know what? It was all good at one point. Well... We will no doubt revisit Euro 2 phase and hopefully it picks up. Yeah. We've anyway. Got, we've got a big game next because next up is Germany when we come back to that game. Okay. Uh, thank you all for listening. Take care and speak to you soon. time.